Hello. Uh, <laughs> how's it going? Uh, what day is today? Today is Saturday the 27th. Uh, which means it's streaming time. Um, uh, let's see, I'm going to do a quick recap of what we did last time and then go into a little bit of stuff that I did offline and then we can start checking on the stuff for today. Um, I, was, I was reminded before the stream that I forgot to uh, start my chat bot or my IRC bot, but fortunately I've got that. Uh, should have written it in Erlang, yeah. Um, then it would have never gone down, right? Because Erlang can never fail. <laughs> um, but yeah, I shut it down after the stream, so that's why I wasn't there. Uh, but anyway, last time I streamed, I worked on um, worked on fixing a memory leak in Vexoig, which is the uh, kind of like backing bits of how Flask works. Um, I found, uh, or I didn't find, um, <laughs> Lyft found this, uh, memory leak in production, uh, when we tried to upgrade Worksoig, Vexoig, uh, to get some other fixes around, uh, returning 204 responses and empty content and all sort of, sorts of fun stuff around there. Where's my brother? Um, he's probably still sleeping, let's be real. Although it's like 4 p.m. in his time, so maybe he's up. Um, he might be in chat. Um, yeah, he's been working on a project, which is why his programming notes haven't really, uh, progressed all that much in the last couple of days. It's been, it's been 11 days since he's pushed. Uh, but he is working on stuff, so I can, I can kind of show you some of the stuff that uh, we've been hacking on together. Uh, so we have this, this project, which was originally given in, um, Intro, uh, an intro to programming course that I taught in college, uh, but that course was in C++, and so we've we've modified it to be uh, Python. Kind of show you what the some of the original functions are like. He's learning like loops and arrays and stuff, or loops and sequences, tuples, lists, etc. Right now, and so these are some of the functions that we're going through, and just like some simple ones that are just print some stuff. Um, figure out whether a, a list is sorted or not, figure out whether it's a Fibonacci sequence, uh, modify the sequence in place to rotate it in, in one direction or another, a bunch of other stuff like that. Some of these are actually pretty tricky though, like uh, retrieving the second largest integer in a uh, 2D structure of integers is actually, it's, it's not as easy as it seems. And in fact, like, I spent a bunch of time uh, trying to re-implement these and, and not trip up on them. But this one was probably the the uh, most complicated. There's actually a... Uh, where's the K? Oh no, not that one. <laughs> these ones are... Actually, this one's not that hard. Um, these ones are hard. Like, has two equal elements in a 2D. Uh, there used to be... Well, there... The, the first time we gave this, there was has k equal elements in a 2D structure, which is uh, kind of hard if you don't have a counter or you don't have any any sort of mapping structure. But so I'm, I'm trying to implement it in the same constraints that uh, I'm requiring him to implement. Brute force is easy. Optimal solutions are hard. Yeah, there's a I mean, there's a nice um, like linear counter solution linear linear time um i guess linear space but anyway these are some of the functions that he's he's working on uh this one's for implementing a minesweeper like game but we haven't gotten to the actual implementation of minesweeper yet but anyway that's why he hasn't pushed to his notes in a while because he's he's hacking on a project also he his computer died and so he's had to we build that from scratch, uh, which, is, which is not great. Do you have tests for him? Well, I'm actually forcing him to write tests. Um, so you can see like he's he's gone through and, and uh, written some PyTest tests for some of these. Now, uh, we'll, we'll get better on writing more complete tests because like this probably should have a test for the empty list or the other sequence types or negatives or I don't know. There's, there's other edge cases that he's not handling right now, but 
he's uh he's doing a pretty good job about uh testing some of these also a lot of these functions have like some predefined inputs and outputs uh that were originally given in the spec so you can see like this one uh we gave you these uh, in intro to programming so these are some that you can like use already um but anyway, that's that's that. Let me do a quick quick recap of last time. Uh, so I was working on this memory leak in in Vexoic, uh, which involved uh, modifying the uh, the bytecode compiler bit of Worksoic, which is the the main performance uh, improvement in 0.15. And so we made a PR which fixed memory leak and added uh, basically took these load consts and turned them into self-references. Uh, I did a bunch of like investigation about the object graph and uh, fixing this, this leak. And so this was the PR that we made during stream last time. Um, the, the basic fix here was to, uh, is it? Is to use like self dot instead of uh, sticking things into contents. That's what I did last time, uh, but as you can see, this PR is closed. <laughs> um, and this is because I uh, was, was not satisfied with this solution, so offline I went and improved on it. There also were a couple of problems with this solution up front. Uh, the first one was uh, you couldn't have a URL parameter named self, and so I fixed that by renaming the self variable to dot self to like get out of the uh, namespace. Um, but then I wanted to not uh, not do this by bytecode compiling and instead switch to an AST based approach, uh, which I which I did successfully. Um, as you can see, it reduced the amount of code by quite a lot. Now some of that is like I collapsed functions and like got rid of some of the stuff, but. I think the, the new code is a little bit easier to understand. I don't know, maybe maybe a little bit. Um, but it, it allowed me to take like chunks of strings and compile them to AST objects, and then construct the uh, construct the function directly with that. It also allows us to directly see what kind of code gets compiled. So. Uh, where so this is the new code that I produced this actually is completely identical to the manual byte code that I was creating in my other PR uh, but now we can actually see like this is the function definition for that that byte code and if we reverse compile it we can see like this is what the function uh, ends up being um, the Kind of sneaky bit here is this function name. Uh, I mean, these function names and these identifiers aren't valid, but this is what the, the string reverse compiles to. Uh, what about security? So we're not actually uh, we're not actually evaling or executing any user space code here. Um, so yeah, I, I assume you see the exec here, and you're like, oh no, the, but the securities. Uh, which which like that's a valid concern. Like if you see exec in code, you should probably be a little bit concerned. Oh, I need to answer this question. I'll get to your question in a second. Heaven, Heaven Kumar P. Uh, let me let me get through this and then I'll I'll look at that. Um, so the only things that are actually getting like evaluated here are the uh, like string representation of a string, which is uh, I hope safe. <laughs> like if you're if you're evaluating that, that's a problem. Um, this static code that I've written here. So there's no there's no special exec going on here, um, and then everything else is built from the AST. Uh, let's see what what else do we build from the AST? Where's the actual AST part? Yeah, so we build some name objects which will uh, basically be used to load a variable. We load um where is it where is it uh, we build a string object of the element here we built some more strings down here in fact this is like joining strings and the other part that we parse is just this uh great function object here 
This is probably the <laughs> the weirdest part of this code, which is where I have to build up the arguments of the function object, um, which is which is a little bit tricky, but um, not not the worst. Uh, the reason for these two branches here is uh, the the function object changed significantly between Python two and Python three, and most of that is around function type annotations and um, and keyword only arguments. And it's going to change again in Python 3.8, unfortunately, uh, because they're adding positional-only arguments, which I say unfortunately because I think it's not a great feature, but I don't know. It's simplified two or three functions in the standard lib, so ship it, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I, th I think it's more unnecessary syntax that's just going to confuse beginners, but that's just me. Um, and the, the only time that exec is being used here is after we... Uh, we build this AST object, then we compile it into a code object, and then exec is going to run that code object so we can get a, a function definition out. And so that's that's really the only like exec that's being used here. So not not sketch. Uh, let's see, the self dot converters lm thing was the thing I thought was weird, by the way, not because it's a security bug, because it feels weird to eval. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Um, this bit here, yeah, because this is this is the only like um, the only dynamic bit that gets uh, substituted without using the AST. I guess technically I could stick this in as an AST dot stir into this subscur element, and that would that would work the same. Uh, I mostly wanted to just get the get the code on to the most obvious parts in strings, and then the the parts that I need to substitute elsewhere, but that's fair. Um, this this part is probably like the the scariest part of this this patch. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what I worked on offline. See, did I do anything else outside of that? I mean, I did. I went to work, so I did. I did work stuff. Work stuff, which is actually what Vuxoig <laughs> is uh, stands for, or um, is tra would translate to. Uh, oh, I guess there was a couple of little things. Uh, so one was a fix up in setup pi upgrade, which let me close some of these. Uh, so what setup pi upgrade is is it takes um, it takes the classic setup.py where you would write out uh, like name, description, all this, all these fields into the setup call in Python, and setup pi upgrade takes that. Uh, code and turns it into declarative metadata. This is kind of the nicer, newer way to write um, set of tools packaging. Uh, so you, you can, uh, well, the main, the main benefit is it turns code into data and data is a lot easier to rewrite and, and work with uh, versus, versus code. Uh, like mutating code can be done and like I have some projects that do it and like Black does it and some of my code formers do it. Uh, but it's it's hard. <laughs> uh, but mutating like INI files is a lot easier because it's it's structured and you you know where everything's going to be and there's no like evaluation going on. Um, so what setup pi upgrade does is it automatically migrates to this this format. And the nice thing is is this is supported in a, like setup tools 31 plus or if you're installing from a wheel you don't have to worry about it at all. Uh, in fact, I like. Here's here's the ver the minimum versions of things that you need to make this work. Um, but anyway, there was a there was a small bug in this where um, package dir, which is how you can do like um, source based uh, or like source layout of packages, which I don't use, so that's why I didn't notice this was broken. <laughs> um, it was kind of broken, and so I, I made a small patch to fix it. Unfortunately, I haven't written tests for this thing yet, so maybe I'll write tests for this later. Um, it, it looks weird to write a patch without tests. But anyway, uh, that was one of the things I did. I also made PyUpgrade not crash in one situation. So PyUpgrade is the tool that takes, um, takes old versions of, um, of source and automatically uh, upgrades them to newer versions. So like these are the Python 2.6 set literals and this is Python 2.7 plus. Um, there's a bunch of other 
uh, rewrites that it does around like comprehensions, format specifiers, Unicode literals, invalid escape sequences. Uh, we did this one a couple streams ago where it changes this uh, invalid literal comparison into equality checks. Uh, we did this one on stream as well. A bunch of other stuff. And uh, it also helps you like burn the bridges with Python 2. So if you want to like uh, be Python 3 only, it, allows, it helps you eliminate old super calls, get rid of inheritance from object, which is no longer necessary, uh, remove code that was using 6 before by automatically rewriting it to the, the um, Python 3 only format. Uh, and probably the most popular of all is the automated F string rewriting. Um, but we did notice a bug in the automated f-string rewriting, which was... This is technically valid, a little bit weird, but technically valid. Uh, there's this mini format spec language in um, format str or in dot format strings, which allows you to have unquoted keys, which get expanded into dictionary accesses. Uh, but PyUpgrade was crashing on them. And definitely just a bit of an oversight. Uh, I made a couple PRs to prevent them from, from it just like skipping those, and maybe in the future I'll make it actually rewrite those cases. I felt that it was just like a little bit too weird to handle. Um, there are some like pretty strange cases here, like you can have a string that's just the double quote string, and that'll look up in this dictionary. Uh, zero, or like any integer, is treated as a, a slice and not a string key zero, um, which is like kind of weird to me, but... I don't know. And uh, uh, this guy is actually a CPython core dev, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. But he couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't find like where this was specified, and it's not specified in PEP 3101. Oh, I wonder if anyone actually replied to this. Uh, it's in PEP 3101. See. We noted that the use of get item within a format string is much more limited than its conventional use. If it starts with a digit, then it is treated as a number. Oh, I guess it is specified. <laughs> My bad. Um, cool. Uh, that's that's kind of neat. Uh, cool. Let me catch up on chat now because I think I've caught up on <laughs> recap. By the way, you actually beat my hand-optimized bytecode and benchmarks on the VM I used to test the original PR, so well done, I guess. <laughs> Rip. <laughs> um, I didn't expect to beat the benchmarks, because the uh, hand twiddle ASM, or the hand twiddle um, Python bytecode was, was pretty, pretty good. Um, one thing that I meant to look into but didn't have time to is how the hand-rolled bytecode performs on PyPy, because I assume that like, my guess is either it confuses the JIT or the JIT is clever enough to, to figure it out, and I just didn't have time to determine that. But I'm sure PyPy does something good. Okay, let me get to this Stack Overflow question now. Uh, let's see, can you explain what this question is asking? Uh, let's see. Oh boy, I don't know enough about NumPy, but we'll, we'll see, see what I can do. Uh, let's see, pandas.factorize with custom array data type. Start off with a random reproducible data array. Okay. We have these values here. We assign A2 to A0. It's a two-dimensional array. Okay, so this I already, <laughs> already kind of have a guess at what's going on here. Um, so it's it's not copying these, but it's reassigning references in here. But we'll 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 see if that's what the bug is uh, later. Packets item size. Cool. Don't know what that means, but that's fine. Let's view each row as a scalar using custom data type that covers two elements. We'll use void D type. I don't know what that means, but okay. <laughs> uh, 8 is the item size, so 8 by 2 equals 16. D type V16. So is that just like viewing it as one big scalar? I don't know. Okay, two things. Two things that I couldn't understand about the 
output. The fourth element of the first output looks wrong. The first output because that is the same idea as the third element. Okay, that makes sense. That's what I was talking about before. Like these are this is a referential assignment, so it's not actually copying there. Uh, okay, so I can explain the first part. <laughs> why does the second output? Why does the second output have an object D type while the D type of B was V16? I don't know anything about pandas, so I can't answer that one. <laughs> We're gonna, I, I don't know the answer to this one. Bigger question: Does pandas dot factorize cover custom data types? Again, I don't, I don't know that. Uh. It does have a bounty open, uh, kind of surprising. So this person answered the first question. I know the answer to the second question. <laughs> or wait, this person answered the second question. I know the answer to the first question. Um, I don't know where they're seeing the like IDs bit out of this here though. But <laughs> I don't know. Um, but they should also see this same uh, pattern for this one here. I don't know why they didn't mention that. I don't. Where are they seeing IDs? Fourth element of the first output looks wrong. The fourth and third elements are. Hey, what's up, Sarcastic Dante? I'm trying to understand this question. <laughs> uh, factorize output. Okay. I don't know why this is... The fourth element of the first output looks wrong. This one here, zero. Because it has the same ID as the third element, but in B. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know enough about pandas. Uh, or NumPy. Because honestly, I don't use either of them very much. Or F, if at all. Um, I suspect the, the key to this answer is that this is these are not uh, copies. These are... These are creating the same object. I guess I can, like show what I'm talking about, <laughs> or at least see if that's the case. Pip install NumPy, something you'll never ever see me do. <laughs> uh. Wait, where's np.random? NumPy has its own random. Oh. Why does NumPy have its own random? Find that. Let me do a couple of modifications here. A2 equals A0, A4, and A6. Okay, so the, the thing that's tricky here is this. Uh, sublist and this sublist are actually the same value. So if we do a zero zero equals some other number. Oh wait, what? <laughs> okay, never mind. I don't know what's going on here. Maybe this does do, do a copy, um, despite what I think it would do. That's that's surprising to me. Uh, it doesn't work like lists. Two, zero. Okay, never mind. I have no idea what's going on. Because <laughs> in, in normal lists, if you had the same structure here, like one, two, three, four. Um, P print, P print, X. Oh, that didn't actually pretty print anything. But if I did x0 equals x2 here, and then reassigned x0, 0 to x1, 
to 999, uh, it would modify both of these elements. But anyway, it clearly demonstrates I know nothing about NumPy uh, and can't answer this question, so sorry about that. Um, rip. Uh, let's see, what else What else do we have here? Uh, I have a question about Pregment. Cool, I can answer about that. Can you point me to some info about how to run pylint inside Docker with Pregment? I don't quite get the Docker, Docker image language different. Okay. Um, so I can show you the, the difference between the two. Uh, the, let's start with the Docker image one first, because I think that one's the simpler one to explain. Let's see, is there a pylint Docker image? Wait, did I already click on this? <laughs> Docker image for pilot checker. What is the tag for this? Let me just play around with this Docker image first and see what's up with it. Yeah, Python. What's up, Planet Vi Planet Victoria? How's your How's your Saturday going? <laughs> Python and Docker. It's it's a good time. <laughs> uh, of course, we don't have Bash in SH. Island version. Not too shabby. I should be surfing. Ooh. That sounds good. I've actually never been surfing. Uh, I've wanted to try it, but never, never really got around to it. All right, so I'm gonna make a pre-commit hook using this Docker image, or, or at least try. Uh, let's see. Let's make a Python file which has a. Um, I don't know, has some thing that, uh, this will trigger, <laughs> I happen to know this triggers uh, Py3k checker. So that's what we're gonna try and, we're gonna try and reproduce this. <laughs> uh, so we need to make a pre-commit config and we're gonna be using a local repo for this. Let's island Docker uh, language, and this one will use Docker image, um, which let me read the docs because I don't remember how it works myself. Uh, Docker image. Okay, so if it doesn't have an entry point, let's see, what is Docker Images Pilots? Okay, so it has an entry point. I don't know what it does though. See what it does. Oh boy, what in the world? If command is HTTP, what is going on here? You can actually like clone something. <laughs> Find code dash name extensions ruin skins. It's this. It seems like something super custom for them, but we'll just we'll just ignore that. Uh, so we're gonna override their entry point. Uh, so we can use entry point pilot, and that'll say run this executable as the entry point. And then we also need the Docker image. So the Docker image was this guy. Hey, what's up, Ryan Roberts? 
Absent lover. Oh wait, FG. Uh, and then types Python. So that's what we want to run over. And then in this case, we're gonna do args py3k just so that it only triggers the py3k linter. Uh, this should in theory work. Let's try it. See what happens. Uh, yeah, that seems to have worked. So it, it ran Docker. Um, I also errored on able to create a file. I don't know what that's about. Uh, but if we fix this, so from future import absolute import, so that'll fix one of the uh, errors here. So now we only have this future division. And if we change this to forced integer division, this should pass now. Uh, it still complains about this stuff, but that goes away if you get rid of ver verbose. At least something works. <laughs> yeah. Um, does this kind of answer your question about uh, Docker image? Or at least that's that's how you would get Docker image working. Uh, for language Docker, it's a little bit different. You would you would make a repo that has. Uh, or this would be precommit hooks.yaml. Uh, ID uh, docker pilot name pilot language docker. Uh, what else do we need here? Types python args 3k. What else do I need? I think that's it. And then you would make a Docker file here. Absolute update. Oops, dash y, no install recommends virtual three. some best practices here and install a minimal init system. Uh, dumb, uh, dumb init dash dash pilot. Think that'll work. Uh, just build it to test that. Docker build t test dot. Uh, so you don't need to mount t.py into the container to check it. Uh, so pre-commit handles that bit for you. Uh, if we look at the docker bit of pre-commit, um, it handles the working directory and uh, mounting for you. You don't have to worry about that part. Where is the part where that happens? Okay, so it assigns the user to the user outside of the container. This is so that any writes inside the container don't end up getting owned by root. Uh, then it volume mounts the current working directory to slash source in read write mode and with whatever this SE Linux garbage does. <laughs> uh, it also sets the work dir to slash source so that uh, it uh, is working from the root of that, that code directory. That's interesting. I didn't know Docker containers don't come with an init system. Yeah, it's actually pretty crappy. Uh, so if I docker run uh, dash rm, how do I show this? Dash ti, uh, let's see. I know trusty comes with Python 3. Uh, time time dot 
sleep. Some large number. So we make a, a sleepy container. Uh, it's just sleeping here. Uh, if I go into grab sleep, I guess. Yeah. So if I go into PS, we can see this uh, Docker process here, and we can see the Python process here. If I kill dash term this, um, well, maybe they fixed it. Nope. <laughs> so I was able to kill the Docker process. Uh, and normally, if you signal the Docker pro process, it signals the container. And then the container would respond to it. Uh, but since this is PID1 inside of the container, this didn't actually die. Um, and in fact, if I kill term this, um, sudo kill term that with uh, whatever. Oh, that's not my password on this computer. Um, we can see that. It didn't actually die because there's no proper init system, and so this actually, the the signal handling of PID one is is treated differently, so it doesn't doesn't kill it. Um, and the only way to kill this is with uh, kill dash nine, um, because that one's uncatchable, and the the kernel will actually kill that. But fun little fact about. Um, init systems and Docker and why you should always run an init system. Um, I actually, my, my intern at Yelp uh, wrote the init system that uh, I'm using in that example called Deminit. Uh, if you want to check it out, there's a cool blog post about it that goes into many more details about basically what I just explained, but in way more way more detail. Um, anyway, that's, that's why I added an init system there. Um, okay, so this builds properly. That's not really what I wanted to show. Okay, uh, initial commit. So let's use that other repo. Uh, we, I guess we can do pre-commit try repo just to show that. Uh, but then I can show you how we could do it in the file. Hook ID Docker pilot missing required key entry. Probably is. Uh, how is entry supposed to work? It'll be right here. Running hooks. For configuring Docker hooks, your entry should correspond to an executable inside the Docker container and it will be used to override the default container entry point. Oh, I see. <laughs> so I didn't need to specify entry point in Docker file because it gets overridden. We would specify it here as entry point uh, dominate islands. Try repo again. You need missing entry. Oh. <laughs> The error is right. I'm just uh, saying one thing and trying another. Uh, I actually don't need to add this if my if the most recent feature works properly. Warning: creating temporary repo with uncommitted changes. Cool. Probably working there. Uh, let's see, installing an environment. Install this environment will be reused. But this is probably running Docker build now. It's running docker build. Um, which is rebuilding the container because it specifies dash dash pull and I didn't do that when I built it. So this will actually take a few minutes. Um, is there a way to experiment with pre-commit config.yaml without committing it every time? Yes, I think that's what uh, try repo is designed for. I assume you mean pre-commit hooks. Is this file? Uh, you can also, you, if you specify files or dash dash files, it won't complain about unstage. So that's why I used all files here. How is it different from system D? Okay, so, so system D is designed to run an entire operating system, whereas, uh, whereas Deminit is in in, like, intended to only be used for containers. Uh, so Deminit's goal is to supervise this, or not even supervise, just run a single process and uh, 
uh, only handles signal forwarding and zombie reaping. So the, the absolute minimum that an init system needs to handle. Whereas system D has a hilarious number of features. Is way too chunky for use um, in a Docker container. But anyway, this, this works now. And if I change this to uh, trigger this again, we can see that if we run this. It uh, now complains properly, which is good. Uh, the reason that it rebuilt this here is uh, the way try repo works is it always creates a temporary directory to install these hooks. Um, but anyway, hopefully that answers your questions about uh, Docker and Precommit. I need to read back on some more questions because I, I realized Ryan Roberts asked a bunch of stuff and I didn't. <laughs> Didn't get to it. But man, we just got project four, so I'm going to start it at five and got like an hour and a half. Cool. It's on image manipulation. Is coding off a terminal hard? Uh, I don't know. I think it's it's not so bad. Uh, I write code in a terminal, although like I used to not write code in a terminal. I think it's definitely easier to not do that. Um, what is the difference between running code versus terminal code? I don't know the answer to that. Gathering C++ coverage is forking annoying. <laughs> yeah, it is fucking annoying. Um, I have a make file that I used to use for this. Let's see if I can find that. Actually, because I think is the tool that I used to use in make, make files. Uh, must be private repo. Speak of. Uh... <laughs> I like how they copied and pasted my uh, make file, <laughs> which is pretty great. Hey, what's up, Mr. Don Brown? Thank you for the follow. Every follow counts. Um. Let me find one of my projects, because these are not my projects. Although, <laughs> they copied my make files because um, make files are great. Old scripts, coverage.sh. What is this? Uh, I don't know why I made a script for this. Really not that useful. Uh, these are my school projects, which is the last time that I played with uh, people's most coverage. Well, here's one that's simple. Here's probably one that's simple. Uh, so most of the magic here. Where's the. Oops. So make file. Make. There we go. Make file. Cruiser done. Yeah, this is a project about boats. <laughs> uh... Okay, so I think this is the first part of the magic to make this work is to specify dash dash coverage. I think you also need dash, dash G. Uh, this project only built in debug mode because uh, we didn't actually care about doing the other stuff. Um, yeah, and I think that's all the magic that was necessary to make this part happen. And then at coverage or like runtime, you have to run gcov. Although <laughs> as one of my most upvoted stack overflow question answers, um, Specifies. Uh, let's see. Gcov out of memory. <laughs> you have to make sure that you match the version that you compile with exactly, otherwise you get inscrutable and crazy ass error messages. Um, where did that go? Uh, but yeah, once you build it, is there a coverage.sh here? Yeah. Once you build it, you essentially run you run your code it'll spit out these like gcda or whatever files uh which contain the coverage information and then you run gcov over it which works well enough although it doesn't have all the nice features that python has where you can like exclude coverage and like mark things as uncoverable which is kind of annoying i don't know <laughs> it's it's all right it's not the greatest it, it works though. It's a lot of work to get it set up though. I definitely agree with that. 
Uh, dude, holy shit, I'm a freshman, this makes me nervous. I just have the gut feeling that I will fail college if I major in CS. That's why I'm afraid of fully going with CS. I mean, I wouldn't worry too much about failing. Like, I think, like, as long as you stay on task and, like, go to class, study, like, you can mostly, mostly get through it and, uh, get that working. Um... See what else do we have here? I think I've learned about mounting work to slash search and try repo. We'll experiment with Docker images later. Cool, awesome. Glad I can help with that. I have another one. Hope I'm not taking too much time. No, I completely <laughs> ask, ask away. That's that's what the stream's for, I guess. Uh, hope I'm not taking too much time. Which iSort hook to pick from the tens of available iSort hooks? What's the deal with seed iSort config? Uh, cool. So I know way too much about this, unfortunately. Um, let me close some tabs so we can show how this works. Uh, uh, that later. Talked about pay upgrade, talked about this. Cool. We'll get to pre commit eventually. I'll write some code eventually, I promise. <laughs> um, okay, so. The thing about iSort, and this is kind of the problem with it. Uh, let's see. DMX. So typically, in a uh, typically when you sort imports, there's kind of like two main approaches, and the the most popular one is to separate imports into like. Standard lib, then third-party imports, and then first-party imports. So let's let's make an example of that. So uh, we'll just make a module called mymod.py, and t will import some stuff. So like, if we import os, that should be standard lib. If we import something like, well, you wouldn't realistically import pre-commit. So do I actually have any libraries that I maintain? Uh, uh, this one, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, and let's say we import our module here. So this is typically how someone would arrange this file if they were separating uh, standard lib, third party, and then first party imports. Uh, and iSort will enforce this uh, sorting by, by default. Uh, the iSort on t.py. Uh, it, it should do it by default. However, if we look at this, uh, it is assumed that this is a first party import and not actually a third party import. But if I install that, sb.refactor imports, and now run iSort on that file, it'll properly identify that this is a third party import. And this is, in in my in my opinion, the uh, the worst part of iSort is that it's actually doing dynamic analysis on all of the imports, like basically importing them and checking where they exist, and then classifying based on that. Um, and so it like it, it needs all of this machinery and all of your dependencies installed in order to properly sort import. Uh, you can work around this though. So if we pip uninstall factor imports, and we isort again. So this is the broken state. Uh, we can work around this by telling isort manually, hey, uh, know that this is a third party import. Known third party equals this. And now if we sort that file, it'll know that this is a third party import and to, to put into those three sections. So you can you can manually tell it, hey, uh, I know your your static analysis is bad. Here's here's uh, here's some hints. Um, and when hooks are run in pre-commit, they're given their own virtual environment, which doesn't have all of your dependencies installed. And so that's why this is a, a big problem. Uh, let me Pre-commit GC to clean up the unused ones here. See if there's a little bit fewer. <laughs> Looks like there's a lot of them. Yeah, 40, 49 uh, cleaned up. Um, so these are the ones that are currently in use by some of my repos that are checked out. Um, and inside each of these repos, 
Um, we'll just look at 4H, for instance. Uh, inside each of these repos, there's virtual environments, which... Uh, which one is this one? This one's my import reorder. <laughs> Uh, just to show that, like, um, pre-commit will not install a bunch of other packages in here. It'll basically only install this repository and nothing else. Uh, but if you install iSort by itself, it can't figure out where these packages are. Uh, now, fortunately, I've written my own import reorder, which doesn't have a bajillion options, uh, so it's, it's not necessarily what you would want to do. Uh, but this import reorder uses a, a library that I showed earlier called aspi.refactor imports. Factor imports. And what this library does is static analysis to determine whether things are first, third, or, uh, or standard lib, or I guess classification. Uh, future imports, application, third party, built in, or still built in. These, these four options. Um, and this does some like heuristics based on file system and import reads, roots and doesn't depend on things being installed. And so this import reorder doesn't care about uh, what you have or don't have installed. Um, I, if I change this example again, let me, let me change this to pyramid because I'm definitely not going to install pyramid. Or Python imports. Uh, let me break the sorting here, and then we'll run that on t.py, and you can see that it, it, it properly identified these these uh, classifications here. And so the kind of like fix to this, and like to enable someone to use isort to work properly, uh, I made a thing called seed isort config. Seed isort config. And what seed isort config does is it uses the machinery that reorder Python imports has in order to statically set this known third party setting. And then isort can work properly given this setting. So it's it's kind of a shim to make isort suck less. Um, and so generally you would use the two together like this. Uh, with seed isort config coming first, and then mirrors isort after it. Uh, although this one will become obsolete soon, uh, this is a, a mirror repository that pre-commit set up, and, and the way the way it works is there's a cron that checks for new versions and then just pushes a, a trivial tag that dumps um, dumps this version this pinned version here. Uh, but a cool thing happened recently in that uh, I sort added the pre-commit configuration directly. And so once they make a new release, we should be able to use this. Let's see, did this actually get included? 922. I don't know if this got included or not. I can go here. Six commits since this release. Uh, I guess not. <laughs> that was on master. Yeah, I don't know how their branching structure works, but it looks like they did not release after that change. Um, oh, wait. No, this would imply that they did. <laughs> Let me see what happens here. Uh, git clone. Never remember how to spell Timothy's name. Let's copy and paste. Get tag four dot three dot seventeen. Nope, no pre commit config. Oh well. Rip them. Um yeah, so that Eventually, they'll merge their develop branch into master, and then uh, then you'll have the pre-commit configuration there. But until that happens, uh, my suggestion is to use mirrors isort and uh, seed isort config using this configuration here. 
Anyway, hopefully that hopefully that answers your question. E, I got it working. What were you working on? Oh, Elkov, I see. Nice. Uh, at last, I saw how you copy and paste instead of typing, typing memorized bazillion character URLs. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I mean, you saw me type out that Docker file earlier. I definitely, definitely have typed that way too many times. <laughs> uh, I saw pre-commit recommended on r slash cpp recently. Oh, interesting. I did not hear about that. Uh, pre-commit. You read it sucks. Oh hey. Cool. If you don't want to use linters, then don't. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I worked with this guy uh, on some some stuff on the issue tracker. Uh, there's there's like some weird calling constructs in um, OCLint, which um, it requires that you have file names before these dashes, and that these are compiler options or something weird. Um, and so like I helped him like write a script to reorder the arguments and um, went back and forth on this, but. Managed to create a cool repo for this, which is uh, pretty awesome. Uh, uh, he must have renamed it. He or she, or, or they, I don't... Uh, oh. oh, I just typed it. It's here. Did I copy and paste? Oh, I forgot the S. Dang it. Anyway. Um, yeah, pretty cool. But... Uh, this is this is actually more upvotes than I got when I posted pre-commit on r slash Python, so uh, rip me, I guess. But that was like in 2014 when we didn't have all the like nice branding and features and stuff. That was five years ago. Damn. Almost, almost, uh, almost exactly five years ago. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I, I did kind of notice the r slash cp stuff. Um, but not not completely. Pretty cool, but the checks take too long for C++. Yeah, because it actually runs a compiler, which is pretty pretty unfortunate. Um, it's it's something. <laughs> cool. All right, I think I think I can actually start writing some code now. One hour into the stream, code code time. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so some stuff that I want to work on today. Uh, if you don't know what pre-commit is, it's a uh, linter runner framework that also knows things about git hooks. Um, it's, um, I don't know, it originally started as just a git hooks manager, but to be honest, it's it's pretty good at that, but it's probably better at installing linters and running them and like managing a centralized configuration virtual env management, tool installation, all that other stuff, uh, which it, it does pretty well. Um, thank you, Mr. Don Brown, for the subscription. That's awesome. I, I don't get too many subscriptions, so I'm uh, pretty happy about that. Thank you very much. Um, and um, yeah, those ones definitely count. <laughs> I usually say that subscription or that follows count, but subscriptions count for way more. Um, but thank you very much. Um, so yeah, let's let's write some code today. Uh, there's a couple of issues that I've had open for quite a while. Um, I'm always happy to support folks that build tools I use every day. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for using the tools too. Because <laughs> it's why I build them. I, I try and make people's lives better. Um, but yeah, there's a couple of issues that have been open on pre-commit for a while, and a brand new issue that looks like a bug, uh, but I want to try and reproduce it and see if it if it happens. Um, unfortunately, the person who reported the issue didn't really give much, uh, in terms of reproduction steps or debug information. So I'm, I'm kind of left guessing a little bit here on how they ended up in this state. Um, but we'll, we'll try and try and reproduce that. 
Um, yeah. So, I'm going to try and reproduce this and, and see how it goes. Regarding the support, where do we send money? Um, that is a good question. I don't really have any, like, way to take money right now. Um, oh, I guess... I think someone set up uh, an open collective for pre-commit at some point, although I haven't looked at it in forever. Yeah, there is there is a um, a uh, pre-commit open collective, although I <laughs> clearly haven't looked at it. Apparently, there's there's money in here that I should probably use for stuff that I've been using for development that's just been out of pocket for now. Um, I don't know. This is potentially one way to contribute. Um, oh, I'll ask again just in case. I definitely missed that. Did you hear about the Docker Hub breach? Uh, which one? Because <laughs> there's been a couple of them. Oh, there's one There's one today. Uh, shit. <laughs> Docker Hub usernames, hashed passwords, GitHub and Bitbucket, access tokens exposed. That's real bad. Uh, fortunately, I don't have a Docker Hub account, so I guess I'm, I don't, I'm not going to be affected by this, but holy shit. Um, Thursday, April 29th, we discovered unauthorized access. Wow. Wow. That's, um, that's a big deal. Uh, but yeah, I don't have a Docker Hub account, so not a problem for me. But yeah, that's pretty sketch. Uh, there was a breach, I want to say like three years ago, where uh, they had a similar problem. Of course, I'm not going to be able to search for it now because there's, there's so much... Um, much news about this this current breach but yeah that's that's big deal recommend support page sounds good but personal account would be better yeah i'll probably i'll try and set something up like that um offline um because yeah it'd be cool to get people to be able to support the stream or and or support the the tech that i work on um but yes <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, sorry I don't have anything set up today. <laughs> yeah, you can subscribe on Twitch, but that's, yeah, Twitch takes half of that. Um, but, I don't know, apparently there's there's probably something that I can set up through, like, Streamlabs or whatever that has, like, I don't know, I think there's, like, a donation widget and, like, managing that information here, but I don't actually know how that works. Um, but... Uh, there's all sorts of like fun. Oh, is this dark mode, light mode? I will leave it in dark mode, whatever. Uh, but yeah, I can probably set up something like that. I just haven't haven't done anything like that yet. Um, okay, so let's look at this issue. I have kind of a guess at how this gets triggered, but I'm not a hundred percent certain. Um, the thing that I remember is that. Um, Let's see, is this Python 2 or Python 3? Is there any way that I can tell? Uh, this is Python 3, uh, which which actually makes it slightly better. Like, this is fixable in Python 3. I don't think it's fixable in Python 2, uh, if, if I'm right. Uh, there's this function called OS replace. Replace. Stop replace. Uh, this is a directory. It will, yeah. So if dust is existing as a file, it will be replaced silently if the user has permission. Uh, if successful, this renaming will be an atomic operation. So on Windows, it's not necessar necessarily atomic because I don't think you can overwrite a file in, pr in place. Um, but this is brand new in Python 3.3, so it's not available in Python 2. And my guess is that I'm using os.rename somewhere which on POSIX is atomic. This will be atomic on POSIX. Um, but on Windows, if it exists, OS error will be raised, which is my guess at what's happening here. Uh, so I'm gonna try and reproduce that. Uh, I'm gonna be using git bash on Windows because it kind of works like bash. Um, 
Oh, I already have a direct appeal to you. Is there anything in here? No. Uh, let's just clone some project of mine. It doesn't actually matter which one it is. Um. So, uh, do I have Prequin installed? I do not. Make up a virtual env and, and get that going. Uh, in the meantime, while that's doing stuff, I can probably search the project for us.rename. That's probably where things are happening. Uh, three places and then tests. Uh, tests aren't actually invoking OS rename. My guess is it's this one right here. But we didn't actually see a stack trace from this guy's bug report, so... For a moment, I thought he typed private SSH key by heart. <laughs> yeah, that would be that'd be pretty special. Um, let's see, yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing this is coming from this rename here. Uh, this one is possible to trigger. Or wait, no, it isn't anymore because now we have a lock. I think this one's not possible anymore. Um, but Freakmit originally was written not for Windows, and so um, it doesn't surprise me that there are probably still some like lurking edge cases that aren't properly handled. Where's this one? Uh, this one also, like I, I I made a bunch of work to make this atomic, um, but then like. We just slammed an exclusive file lock on this, so this isn't this isn't a problem anymore. So I'm pretty sure it's this one. So let's try and make a way to reproduce this. And so this code right here is only triggered in the migration case of Precommit. So Precommit can be run alongside other hook managers, um, and it'll just like move the original hook to the side and then run that first, and then run Precommit after. Uh, so we can kind of demonstrate that. Get hooks Precommit. So, uh, if I make a hook like this and I run recommit install. Wait, why did that tab complete? Did I install precommit? Why is, why is this tab completing? I don't understand. I'm really confused why that's tab completing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose my damn mind. Um, Cause I didn't install pre-commit. I don't have it on my path. Like we saw which pre-commit doesn't, but when I, uh, anyway, <laughs> there's, there's some, there's some magic going on here that I, I don't understand and don't really want to understand. But that's fine. I'll just uh, pretend everything's okay. <laughs> Let's install pre-commit. Uh, if I run pre-commit install, it'll print out a special message here that's like running in migration mode with existing hooks. Um, and what it did here... Um, what it did here is it uh, installed this pre-commit configuration. This is the one for pre-commit itself. So we look at that. Oh god, what? Git hooks pre-commit. Uh, so this is the little script that pre-commit writes into the git directory, which basically bootstraps uh, the execution of pre-commit. It does some little things around like running the legacy file and um, skipping in some cases and now, the script has gotten longer and longer over time, but it originally was like one line, which is just exec pre-commit, but it's, it's gotten a little bit longer, a little bit of complexity there, but for the most part, it's just run the legacy file, then run the normal one. So now if I make a commit, allow empty foo, uh, you can see that the first hook script, the manual bash script that I wrote before, uh, which is this legacy script, got ran first. Uh, and now it's running pre-commit. 
we're installing the environments for pre-commit and then it'll it'll run that. Um that's gonna take a while because it's Windows. Uh do to do, do okay, we'll answer chat questions while that's going. Dissidence asks, hey Anthony Reds Code, do you know an ID that doesn't open the files in the temporary folder instead of the work directory? Pilot doesn't detect includes from the work directory because of that. Uh, that doesn't open files in a temporary directory. Okay, so what I what I think you're asking is there's a lot of uh, editors and IDEs that when they want to lint something, uh, like check it with Flake 8 or whatever, uh, they either copy the contents to a tempter or pipe it to like standard in and uh, lint from that way. And uh, whether there's an ID that doesn't do that. Um, that's a good question. I definitely understand the problem though, because like Pilot needs to know about all your imports in order to work properly. Although, I think that might be, that might also be a problem with Pilot not knowing where your virtual environment is, so, um, probably need to twiddle that instead? I don't know. Um, but no, I don't actually work too much with, um, uh, with IDs, unfortunately, so I don't really quite know how to answer that. Um, I know in, like, um, in, like, a couple of IDEs, you can just specify a command to run and, like, what working directory that command will use and, like, what path you need. Um, but I don't... Without knowing which ID you're trying to use, I can't really, can't really know much more than there. It looks like it's on Pilot, really. Yeah, it's that would be my guess is that uh, Pilot is probably uh, not running from the right virtual environment or something like that. Uh, not super, not super sure there. But that would that'd be my guess. <laughs> Man, this takes forever. The first run. Um, but like the second run is is quick because it pre-installs everything. Uh, but we can see this this legacy hook here. Um, in fact, if we look, it's the same um, pre-commit dot legacy. It's the same hook that we saw before, which is just this uh, echo high script. My guess is if I copy this. If I copy this to this script, uh, my guess is that if I run pre-commit install, we'll see that stack. That's what I'm hoping. <laughs> I'm hoping it crashes. Okay, that's, that's good. Uh, and now I can attach an actual log to that. Uh, at guy. <laughs> I like how there's, there's backslashes here, but forward slashes here, and then backslashes again. Like, all right. Um, Uh, let's see. Never mind. I was able to reproduce this by doing the following. One. Uh, I guess I can just write a bash script that does this. Echo dash e user bin and bash. Go hi to get hooks. Pre-commit. Pre-commit install. Do this again and then pre-commit install. When I ran the last pre-commit install, I ended up with this output. enough I guess okay so now we know now we know the bug uh, it's time to try and fix it I guess 
Ooh, lots of chat. Okay, let's see. Uh, are you running Pylant in your IDE in the background? No, it's VS Code running it automatically for like IntelliSense. I see. I seem to remember something about PyCharm and Pylant integration, but it's recommended not using it as that it was really slow. <laughs> yeah, Pylant is Pylant is pretty slow. I wish I could make it faster. Uh, you can maybe pass args to Pylant to mock a root folder. I don't use VS Code, so I can't help much really. I prefer running PyLS and MyPy2 over Pylant. What is PyLS? Oh, Python language server, I see. Yeah, yeah, You should instead run it from a file system watcher, so the ID probably saves on focus cost or something. That would make sense. Um, but yeah, there is a setting for Py or there's an argument for Pylant that does this, if I remember what it is. I have a virtual in somewhere, right? Yeah. Install Pylant. Million options. Man, that takes forever just to run the help. Why does it take so long to start up? <laughs> 700 milliseconds just to start up. It's crazy time. Anyway. Uh, so you can use init hook. I've done that before to modify sys.path. Yeah, so I think it was init hook that I used before. This one here. Um, double quotes. Let's try something like this. Uh, let's do import part prefix. So if I just run pylant on this, uh, no module doc string, fine. Uh, yeah, so we get import error here, but if we run it with this init hook, uh, it's still broken. Unable to import pre-commit. Uh, <laughs> code scored negative 20, yeah. <laughs> uh, Maybe we need this path as well. This so path zero colon zero. This and then wish it told me what the import error was. If I had a nickel for every time I muttered fuck you, pilot. <laughs> uh, that's the cool error most people most people get, yeah. Don't you have to run pilot like a thousand times to apply fixes, or is that some other linter? I think that's uh, this one. Or are you thinking of auto pipit? I know this one often takes many, many passes to get it to like not not um resolved why are you not able to import pre-commit you totally should be able to oh auto pep 8 uh yeah sometimes auto pep 8 will take multiple passes to get to stuff i like it though uh h h a t o auto pep 8 eto yeah i don't know i use auto pep 8 i really like it um but sometimes you're right oh duh should be home base tilly. Bye. 
Um... Uh, so I personally like to use, uh, so like, black is great. Um, it does does awesome things. Uh, I just don't like to use it. I don't agree with some of the stuff it does. Um, so I use a combination of a bunch of different formatters. Uh, so my products use, uh, so the first one, the first one that I disagree with black is its choice on single quoted versus double quoted strings. And uh, I wrote a formatter that existed way before Black did that did the opposite, uh, which is called. Where is it? String. Ooh, not what we want to show. Um, let me make sure there's nothing bad there, or I'll have to edit it out. What was that? History? H. Okay, there's nothing bad here. Be good. <laughs> uh, I don't really use Chrome for anything other than streaming anyway. Uh, so there's this double quote string fixer, which will convert everything to single quoted strings. Uh, so that's the first part of, of formatters that I use. Uh, then I use auto pep 8, although I use it in a mode which causes it to not reflow lines. So, uh, is this one? Yeah. So I, I tell it to turn off these two options, which cause it to rewrite. This one causes it to rewrite comments, which I don't really like. And this one causes it to add line breaks, which I'd rather manually do that myself. Uh, and this one just makes auto pipe faster. Um, because uh, this rule fights with W503 and auto pipe will flip back and forth between the two and then spit out different results based on that. Uh, so I've just been excluding this. Uh, okay, so auto of 8, double quote string fixer. Um, I use an import reorder that I wrote and talked about earlier. Silly reorder. And unfortunately, this is like one of my only projects that uses underscores here. This is before that I realized that dashes are better than underscores. Um, but I always forget this. And so what I've learned about GitHub is if you rename a project and then rename it back, uh, GitHub will put redirects in place, so I can put dashes here and it'll redirect to the underscores. But <laughs> Tiny, uh, sneaky thing about GitHub. Uh, but I use this as my import reorder. It has a very strict, uh, like, not very much configuration setup, uh, which puts one import per line to avoid merge conflicts and make it so that you can, like, no QA or, like, Pilot exclude single lines without uh, opting out of all the other lines. Uh, it also has some nice features about like getting rid of old code if you need to do like Python 3 plus or like add future imports if you want to do Python 2, Python 3 compatibility. Um, so I don't know. This is the import reorder I use. I also use a formatter called PyUpgrade. Uh, which just does some syntax upgrades. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Um, for the most part, I've gotten to the, the point where I don't write the old syntax and like, it's it's mostly just to like enforce this for new contributors. Uh, but the thing that's most close to black and is a lot less intrusive than black is this hook that I wrote called add trailing comma, which does a number of things that black also does, but I don't know, I can find. I think mine is a little less difficult or a little easier to understand. Black's rules for adding trailing comma are a little bit complicated. And black will reflow your code, which this uh, this will never reflow. It will only just add the commas and uh, adjust a little bit of white space. Whereas black might like take a multi-line call and turn it into a single line call or take a multi-line call and fold the arguments up next to each other. I don't know. I don't, uh, sometimes it's useful to have like one argument per line when you're describing stuff or like when you're calling sub processes you might do pairs of arguments per line whatever um but this is the uh the calling construct that it aims for so notably like uh trailing commas here everything is all lined up here nothing hugging at the beginning nothing hugging at the end uh it avoids stuff like 
arbitrary 15 space indents. Um, it also allows adding and removing a parameter to preserve git blame and produce a minimal diff. Like if you didn't have trailing commas, you would modify all three of the lines, but if you did have trailing commas, it would just be a single line insertion. Um, and these are the these are the things that add trailing comma does. So it will add trailing commas. Surprise, surprise. Um, in Python 3.5 plus on function calls, it will add trailing commas to star arguments. Uh, in Python 3.4 and lower and Python 2, this is invalid syntax. Uh, just due to like an oversight in the grammar. Um, but Python 3.5 allowed this in function calls. Uh, we'll get to we'll get to function definitions later. It didn't get added for function definitions here due to again probably an oversight. Um, it adds it for literals and function definitions that don't have star args for all versions. Uh, and in Python 3.6, they fixed star args and function definitions, so we could have trailing commas there. And for keyword only arguments, it also was kind of weird. But it was a syntax error before. Uh, if you have multi-line from imports, I don't do this, but if, if you do, uh, add trailing comma knows how to put a comma here. It also knows how to do that if you have a class definition that spans multiple lines, although this rarely happens, uh, but only sometimes. Uh, and it'll also fix up the the hugginess of um, parens here. So if, if this was hugged on the end, it'll unhug it and put a comma here. And if it's hugged on the beginning, it will unhug, reindent, and, and put the commas in here. It also tries pretty hard to make the indentation of these braces match um, to enforce a consistent style. But anyway, that's that's the uh, code parameters that I use. Uh, so let me understand, without pilot, I get no IntelliSense on VS Code. Is pilot the same thing as IntelliSense? It shouldn't be. Um, I'm actually not sure what VS Code uh, uses to do its parsing. VS Code, Python Code. So pilot is usually just a code linter, although the, the machinery behind pilot, uh, Asteroid and its related tools, uh, have some amount of like type inference and such. Um, autocomplete and intelligence. How does it work? So the the linting stuff should be coming from pilot or any of these other linters. Um, I personally don't use pilot because I think it's a little bit too strict uh, and a little bit too slow and it requires dynamic analysis to actually do stuff in a useful manner. Uh, I don't know, I'm not saying pilot is bad, it's just like something that uh, the trade-offs aren't there for me to use it. Um, but how does the IntelliSense work? Um, the Python user. Just want to know how it works. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna have to look it up on GitHub probably. Um, but I seem to remember when I opened up code for the first time. Um, what are you mad about here? Let's see, you can change. Where's the where's the error? You can change the Python interpreter by going to the Python extension. Cool. Yeah, whatever. Unable to import. Okay, so this is Pilot complaining about an import error. Oh, I shouldn't have hid that hint because now I don't know how to. Uh... Visual Studio Code. That's how you quit. Where's the project preferences? Uh, oh, this one down here. Uh, settings.
Can you set the interpreter to your virtual enemy? Yeah, that's what I was trying to do. <laughs> but unfortunately, I hid the hint. Maybe if I close it and open it again, it'll show me the hint again. Come on, show me the hint. Go away. Come on, where's my hint? Press F1. Oh, Python, select interpreter. Uh, VM, bin, Python, this one. Now I need to install pre commit into there, probably. Uh, not pilots. Seems to notice stuff now. Silence is not mad anymore. Maybe that's it? Uh, seems to work. <laughs> um, main dot main. I don't know. Seems, that seems to kind of work. Uh, so all I did was I have a virtual amp here. Uh, and inside the virtual env, I have I have pilots and all of my dependencies installed. And then all I did was F1 Python select interpreter, and then I picked the one that corresponded to my virtual environment. And I think that's all I needed to do. But it seems to work. Hopefully that hopefully that helps. Um, I assume this would also help if you were using like Flake 8 or something else. Oh, I don't know what a virtual environment is. Oh, okay. Uh, so you're probably just installing everything to your system right now. Um, so there's there's two ways to make a virtual env in, in modern Python. Uh, so let's start over with no virtual environment. Uh, the first is to use the VM module, Python 3-M VM. Um, and what this allows you to do is make basically a separate installation of Python where you can install packages that uh, don't affect the rest of your system. So if I make a virtual env here, um, so it, it has like its own set of pip and its own Python, its own Python 3. Uh, you can activate a virtual env, which basically just prefixes your path with it. So if we do dot, or I guess I'll, I'll write it out. So source my virtual env bin activate, and that'll add this to your prompt, and it sets uh, this bin path on the beginning of your, your uh, executable path. So now if I say, like, which Python, it'll resolve to the Python that's in this separate uh, like mini installation. It's not actually a separate installation of Python, but it's a separate like prefix environment. Uh, and then from there you can pip install things. So say I did like pip install pre-commit. Um, ignore those warnings. <laughs> and like pip install pilot. Um, so now when I select the interpreter here, select interpreter, uh, VS Code's kind of clever and figures out several virtual ends that could be used, and so I could select this uh, this virtual end here. And you could see, like, if I tried to do import aspi.refactor imports, I would get pilot would complain here. Yeah. So it's complaining here that there's no name uh, refactor imports. However, if I switch this to aspi.yaml, which is a dependency of pre-commit, saved. Um, Pilot now recognizes that. Uh, but the nice thing about virtual environments is you can install stuff there and not uh, pollute your system with um, with packages. Um, but anyway, hopefully that helps. Wait, I think the error is still there. Uh, it's gone on my screen. In order to reproduce, you need a module within your working directory. Okay, so 
I do we're in t.py, so if I do import my mod, my mod. It's tab completing, so that seems promising. Seems seems to work. Put something in that file. Print my mod dot x. Yeah, I think it's it looks like it's working. So it's like a Docker container for only Python. Yeah, that's one way you could think about it. Um, the the idea of like prefix environments actually super predates Docker though. The the way it kind of works is it gets its own um, it gets its own site packages, which is basically the place where uh, pip will install packages. So we can see like uh, inside my virtual env lib Python 3.6 site packages. Uh, this is all of the uh, all of the packages that are just installed in that separate virtual app. Um, normally, they would get installed into user lib python 3.6. Uh, on Debian, it would be in disk packages. Or wait, python 3 disk packages? Yeah. But on Debian, they get installed into this directory. So these are all of the system installed things. Although, I didn't install any of these. These are just things that are necessary to make the operating system work. Why is setup tools installed? It shouldn't be installed. Hmm. Well. Uh, oh, a module with init.py. Okay, let's try that. Uh, make your my package touch my package slash init.py. <laughs> uh, please don't isolate what I just said. <laughs> uh, I should have called it something else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, yes, sarcastic Dante, that is exactly what I just said. Uh, okay, so let's do import my package dot foo and see if the intelligence works. My package dot foo dot x. Yeah, I mean that seems seems to work. Um uh, <laughs> I think I saw the clip number just go up, so somebody must have clipped it. Good job, guys. Uh, thank you, Fear Me Not 15, for the follow. Every follow counts. Um, I will not fear you, so I guess you've got that going for you. Um, but yeah, this, this seems to work for me, dissidents. I'm not sure what's going on with you. Uh, it could be the way that I opened VS Code. Um, like, let me try and closing it and then, like, opening code like this and then opening a specific project. No, that seems to have worked also. This should air. Okay, yeah. What is, it? what is it complaining about here? My package has no WAT member. Hopefully VM works for me too. Hopefully, yeah. Um, so if you if you want, uh, so there's two ways to do virtual items. There's the built-in VM module. Python three. Shit. There's there's the Python three VM module, which is what I showed over here. Uh, and then there's virtualenv.pypa.org. PPA virtualenv. Uh, and then there's PyPA virtualenv, which is a separate implementation. Uh, there's reasons to use one over the other. Um, I hope to like write up a or, like make a I don't know, write up either write up a blog post or make a set of slides and a video about the differences between the two and like why I prefer virtual env over VM. Um, but they both work. So like whatever whatever works for you, go for that one. Um, I personally prefer to use this one. Uh, partially because I it's it's the it's the devil I know. <laughs> uh, but also because it allows you to do cross version installs. And in fact like virtual env is the it's kind of the basis for how pre-commit does all of its environment isolation. Although pre-commit has an option to use 
uh, the VM's module if you, if you so desired to do that instead. Um, yeah, distance. This seems to be working for me, so I'm I'm a little confused. Um, one thing that you might be seeing, like if I don't import the full package, so if I just import this, this should be an error now. No, Pilot doesn't do this. It should be complaining that this is not available yet because I didn't actually import my package that food, but whatever. Maybe Pilot doesn't complain about that anymore. Just a question, do you include your virtual env in your workspace for Git, for example? Uh, so I don't check it in. Um, so I make sure to git ignore it. Um, so I, I usually have this line in all of my projects, uh, so it doesn't get checked in. Uh, but I do usually include like the requirements necessary to build all of the stuff, or to install all the stuff that I need in that virtual env. Uh, so like in this case, I need PyTest for my tests. I need coverage to run coverage. Uh, I use a PyTest plugin called PyTest env to set some environment variables. I use mock to monkey patch some stuff in tests. I don't actually use Flake 8 during development. I can probably get rid of this because uh, I now just, oops, caps lock. Uh, I now just run pre or Flake 8 via pre commit. So I don't actually use it too often in my development virtual ones. Um, but yeah, I, I do build virtual ends and, and use them for all my projects. Um, Creekmit version. Uh, that's an old version. Why is that an old version? Oh, probably just hadn't refreshed the install. Creekmit version. There we go. Uh, but yeah, I use I use virtual env to do almost all of my development. And in fact, like if you've used uh, Talks, which is a uh, like test runner thing, uh, it uses virtual env behind the scenes. So if we let's see how I use Talks in this directory, yeah. So like these Talks uh, directories here are actually uh, virtual envs themselves. They have they have the same like activate file and separate Python installation in here. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's, that's a crash course on friction. Hopefully, it helps you fix your editor woes. Uh, but yeah, what was I doing? Oh right, I was working on this bug here. Um, so we have we have the reproduction. I should be able to write a test for that and then fix it. How big is the VM folder, by the way? It seems like it would take up a lot of space across projects if there's only one VM for project. Uh, so it ends up not being that big, uh, and it depends on which tech you use. So if I use an MVM uh, virtual env, let me just make an empty one so we can see it before. Uh, we can see the difference in size between a blank one and one with some dependencies installed. du uh, hs vmv2. Uh, so this is just an empty virtual env, takes 40 kilobytes, which is basically nothing. Uh, but with like pylint and pre-commit installed, it should take a little bit more, uh, like 27 megabytes. Is it's it's a little chunky, but it's it's not that big. Uh, a virtual env, like a a pypa virtual env, will take a little bit more. We're gonna empty one of those. This takes 17 megabytes, uh, just to, just to start with. And the reason for this is. Uh, if, we, if we look at all the contents of the PyVM or PVM bin, uh, you can see that there's an actual executable here, and that's where most of this size comes from. Uh, but in the in the MVM virtual ems, these are just symlinks to a different Python executable. It's actually wrong. Oops. Oh well. Uh, I guess it works, but anyway, yeah. So the the MVM ones use uh, symlinks, and that's because the the standard lib has some clever code in place that makes the VM module work. Whereas uh, IPA virtual env has to uh, do some special shims. I don't know. But if we look in like pre-commit. Uh, this virtual one is like 45 megabytes, which actually isn't that big. It does add up over time, and like 
if you look at all of the virtual items that Pre-Commit has to accumulate, um, it gets pretty big. Like this is almost two gigs. Um, I could probably make it smaller by cleaning some of them up, but like, whatever. It's not, it's not a huge deal. Um, and the nice thing about the ones in Pre-Commit is they get shared across projects, so it's not like one per project. Um, <laughs> it's not like node modules big, yeah. Uh, it can it can get there, but uh, usually usually smaller. Uh, but I guess that's the cor correct thing to do. I only have a few M's shared across multiple projects, but they aren't really minimal. Yeah, that's that's another way to do it. Um, I also have one virtual M that I stick inside my home directory. Uh, oops, that's not what I want. Uh, and this virtual M has a bunch of tools installed. Not really uh, executables, but tools. Um, and then I simulate those into my bin directory. So these are a bunch of a bunch of tools like Activator, Flakeate, uh, Precommit, Fox, Wine, and Virtual Env. Uh, so I don't actually do any system installs on my computer because um, I don't like messing with the system package manager, and it's super easy to like. Um, Get messed up on that so it's uh it's it's nice for me to be able to isolate all of my um installations that way i guess i've talked about most of these tools i haven't talked about activator yet activator with two a's uh this is a tool that i wrote uh it's pretty nifty um it makes it so that uh you can automatically activate virtual end. so you saw earlier i had to do like when i cd it into pre-command i had to do uh, dot vm slash bin slash activate. I had to basically run this in order to get inside my virtual environment, and then I had to run deactivate to get out of it. Uh, activator gives you a way to automate this. So if we look inside this other repo that I have at this uh, dot activate dot sh, uh, which is a sim link to that virtual ends activate. And we also looked at deactivate.sh, which just has that deactivate command. Um, Activator knows that when I cd into that directory, uh, it'll auto-activate that virtual end for me. So you can see uh, we've, we've entered this context, and I didn't have to manually run the activate script. And it does that um, through a little bit of magic. Uh, the way it works is it sets this thing in bash called prompt command. Um, I also set some other stuff in prompt command, but this part is from Activator. Uh, so what it's doing here is it's evaling this call to Activator, which spits out some bash commands, uh, and basically says run the Activate script. Uh, that's, that's how it ticks. And the way prompt command works is it runs in between every single, um, every single command that you run on the, on the prompt. So it's kind of like PS1, but different. Uh, so if I did like prompt command, uh, prompt command equals echo high. Uh, now whenever I make a new prompt, it's gonna print out high. But yeah, that's how that's how activator works. <laughs> Quick, give him some questions before he starts cloning again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, so true. An hour and fifty minutes, and I have written. I mean, I wrote some code to show, to answer some questions, but um, I haven't actually started working on this bug yet. But joke's on you, I can, I can write some quick code. Uh, let's see, multi install windows. S command install uninstall legacy. So we want to basically validate that um, that we can install twice. Yes. Does this install existing hooks no overwrite? Um, test legacy overwriting legacy hook. How did we do this before? 
Enter factory and store. I can just kind of copy this code and then run install and then so this should trigger the bug on Windows. Uh, actually, let's let's reproduce that on on Windows and see what happens. Paste that test in here. I don't know how to copy and paste. <laughs> Okay, cool. So we I've written a test which reproduces this bug, and so now we just need to fix. And so the one way to fix it is to uh, change this from rename to replace, uh, but that won't work in Python 2, but I want to show that it works first. So we change it to replace, cool, the test passes. Uh, so that's how we can fix it in Python 3. But we basically need a way to do os.replace in Python 2. Do I have a compat module here? Uh, I have a module called 5. That's <laughs> my compat module, right? Uh, oh. It doesn't really do anything anymore. six is a dependency. All right, it's inside of .cfg. I do. Okay, so I can use six. Makes this easy. If six dot pi two goes replace. kind of like a poor, man, poor man's OS start replace. I guess I could look at how it gets implemented in Python 3. Python. I can also Google OS start replace Python 2. Hi OS replace. I could use this backport. Python 3.1 is not supported. Please upgrade to Python 3.2 or better. This dance says works with virtual M, but no error. Nice. Oh yeah, this is the guy that did the open a cell patch for Python. Uh, here's the codes for this. Of course it's on Bitbucket. Why would it be on anything like normal? Run talks.bat. Hmm. Alright, OS replace. Where's the windows? Move file XW. Oh, huh, move file replace existing. That's cool. I didn't know that was a thing. I'm not gonna use this backport. I'm just gonna we're gonna half-ass this because <laughs> I, I don't care so much about Python two and it'll it'll go away eventually. And this is not like a 
a uh, multi-processing critical piece of code. Like it's literally somebody typing something on the uh, man line. Uh, do I have Python 2 installed on Windows? Actually, let me make sure the test still passes. Cool. I do virtual one vm two two seven python dot exe. Make yourselves a python two virtual one. Oh, you spoke too soon. No, your pilot is still broken. What are you getting now, distance? So one really annoying thing about virtual ems is on Windows the bin directory is called scripts, uh, but on every other platform it's bin. <laughs> so I always have to remember to like use scripts and not bin on on Windows. Also, it's capital scripts, so I press capital S. I just mock. All, all the things. Cool, so that passes on Windows. No need to apologize distance. It's the same error as before. Uh, let's see what we got here. From meme one import test. Oh, you're in a module. Oh, okay. So does, does your directory structure look like this? Uh, so let's say this is our project root. You have like meme module and then meme module and init.py and meme1.py. Is this what your structure looks like? Yes, that's the structure. So then your import should be uh, from, it should be like this. That's all you're editing. Yeah. You should have from dot meme one import test. Or may may, as I like to call it. Uh, so this should work. And then, like, if you did Python dash m meme module, uh, or import meme module, uh, so then that would work. Sorry, I got an example from someone's Git, and that's how they did it, so I don't know. Oh, they were probably using Python 2. Uh, so if I do... If I don't do this dot here, uh, this is invalid in Python 3, so we get this no, mo no module named meme 1, which is why the error is there. Uh, but Python 2 allows automatic relative imports, um, which is just a thing that got, got killed. Um, and so you need an explicit relative, or you need to fully qualify uh, the module name here. This is probably what I would do and suggest, is to fully qualify fully qualify this module name. They use print with parentheses, so it was Python 3, right? Uh, so technically you can do print in Python 2 with parentheses in most cases. So let's say I did print 1. Uh, this works in Python 2. And the reason for this is Python 2. The reason for this is is it still parses as a print statement with a uh, with a value that it's printing. Um, and the reason for this is is this parses as a parenthesized number. So like, this actually isn't a function call. Uh, it doesn't really care there. 
Um, but yeah, it's just a... It's just a parentheses number. <laughs> and um, you could put as many parentheses here as you wanted. And... You put as many parentheses here and it would still work. In fact, it works in Python 2 and Python 3. Um, and you can enable print as a function by doing from future import print function. And this makes the uh, parser and compiler treat um, this as a function and like bans, bans the old school uh, print statement. So even in Python 2, with that uh, future import, it bans that. I mean, that would be would be allowed without the future import. Um, so yeah, the, their code was probably Python 2. Um, <laughs> oh no, Sarcastic Dante is fighting with the uh, GCov compatibility problems. Yeah, GCov seems to... I don't know what it is, but like it seems to break with every version of GCC that gets released, which um, is unfortunate. But you know, it kind of makes sense because it needs to know the internals of the uh, GCC uh, compilation output and bytecode hooks and all that shenanigans. I guess it's not bytecode. Machine code. Why is that rename different in Python 2.7? Yeah, I mean, this is to be expected. Oh, I could use shutil.move? Hmm, let's try that. It seems better. But I don't need my compat code. move Python. Move recursively move a file or directory to another location. If the destination is an existing directory, then it's moved inside. It may be overwritten depending on rename semantic. That sounds like it won't work. <laughs> Let's try it. Guess it does work. That's weird. That's not at all what I expected. It's at the top. Of my... This is really annoying. So I often look at PyDoc to find the docs for a module. In Python 2, the file name is at the top, and I almost always want to look at the source and like, because these these docs are pretty like, I mean they're they're fine, but they're kind of useless in my opinion. Like you have to scroll through all this shit to find what you're looking for. But in Python 3, they moved it to the end of the file, so my my muscle memory is to do pydoc and then shift G to go to the bottom of the file and then copy and paste this. But I actually want to look at the Python 2 version right now, so let's do that. Okay. SHUtil.move. So if destination is a directory, then so this isn't relevant. So first we try rename. If that fails, and it's a directory, and it's not a directory, then it calls copy to which will copy the source to the destination and then it'll remove the source. Okay, so this is the case that's happening in Python 2. Okay, that makes it easier, I guess. I don't need this code. I don't need this code. I can use shutil. <laughs> Shit util. Um, This should work in Python 2 and Python 3. Ooh. 
where did my other VM go? Oh, it was probably over here. Scripts. Cool. Wait, what? Why is this one green, but the other one is not? Oh, that's why. Okay. So when I ran PyTest here, um, this is actually an alias to WinPTY PyTest, which causes it to use like a fake Windows shell thing, because uh, this is just an emulated shell here. And in WinPTY, the colors work, but uh, when I just ran it directly, it didn't make a Windows PTY thingy. I don't, I don't really know how it works. It's a little bit of magic. Uh, but because it didn't do that, the colors didn't work here. But I think if I put WinPTY here, then the colors will work again. Yeah. Okay, so that's not bad. Uh, let me just copy this and we'll apply this patch right here. Oh, this is not in pre-commit. Recently passed a thousand issues in in pre-commit. That's kind of crazy. Uh, fully specifying the module name works. Nice. Uh, Gcover.com. Why did that crash? Why did that not load? What's up, Philip Way? Thank you for the follow. Every follow counts. I don't know why you sent me this link, sarcastic Dante? Other than. It doesn't load. Hey, outdated version. How's your How's your Saturday going? Mine's going pretty well. Um, working on a Windows bug in pre-commit. Uh, well, I already fixed it, but um, th these are the lines of code that I've written so far. Uh, get stat. I've written eleven lines of code, and it has been two hours and eight minutes. So. Doing, doing great. Uh, fix. Uh, double legacy install on Windows. Really craving a Philly cheesesteak and for the audio on my forking computer to be louder. <laughs> hey, what's up, Python developer? It's going pretty well. How's your Saturday? Uh... Why is your audio so quiet, outdated version? Um, all I, I mean, I guess I have this problem on my laptop. Like, there's some times where I'm like in a room with a fan on and I have YouTube at the max volume, I have Firefox at the max volume, I have, um, I have uh, YouTube, Firefox, and my Windows volume at the max volume and I still can't hear it. Um, Will you explain your questions in your FAQ? Yeah, I will. <laughs> I do it almost every stream. Um, I do have YouTube videos for that. Um, I can drop you one of them, but I'll, I'll explain them quickly as well. Uh, let me find, where is that? Uh, I sent this to someone on Slack. Who did I send it to? Oh yes, here it is. Yeah, so here's a here's a pretty good explanation on YouTube. I haven't finished my YouTube video about it yet, but hopefully hopefully soon. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do I do plan to finish up my description at some point. But unfortunately, I only get like one one uh, like one or two hours a week where I actually pay attention to it, so I completely miss it. Um, but yeah, okay. So TLDR: Why do I use Windows? Um, I play video games, and I've used Windows my entire life, so I'm super familiar with it. 
but the developer tools on Linux are way better, uh, in my opinion. So I tend to use that um, for developing, so that's why I have a virtual machine. Although uh, I've <laughs> I spent some time working on Windows today to try and work on this Windows bug. Uh, it's also nice to have a virtual machine because then I can switch back and forth between the different contexts and debug different systems. Oh, and actually, uh, I recently bought a um, a Mac um, just so that I can <laughs> debug Mac issues as well. So this is my, I have this, um, I, I bought like a really cheap Mac mini to stick in my living room. And so this is, this is that. Um, it's pretty slow. Right, I have another computer. Um, I can also SSH directly into that, so I don't have to do that instead. 192.168.1.5. Yes. Yeah. This is really slow. Uh, the problem is it's going over Wi-Fi right now. I need to like plug it in so it's not so much lag. But um, my goal here is to be able to do some Python development here. Because uh, occasionally I need to build stuff on macOS or debug weird Mac issues, and so that's why I bought <laughs> a Mac Mini just for this. Um, but anyway, so that's why I use Windows. Um, also, I tend to destroy, or I tend to break Linux machines pretty often, like with kernel upgrades or whatever. And so if I if I break my VM, it's completely fine. I can just start over from scratch, and I have Bootstrap scripts that build or like install the software I care about. Uh, and then the next FAQ question is Nano. Why do I use Nano like a complete, a complete noob? Um, uh, so way back in the day, I used to use Notepad, and Notepad was enough to get me by when I did crappy PHP web development, and my code was really low quality and hard to read, and not indented properly, and in general just like trash. But I mean, it it did what it needed to do, I guess. Uh, but then I got my first job, uh, for my, my first internship, I guess, um, and they were a Java shop, uh, although I think I still used Notepad to write Java there. Uh, but then I got moved to a C-sharp team and started using Visual Studio, and I absolutely loved it. Visual Studio is amazing. Uh, it's great. You just, like, you don't need to know how to code. You just write a few letters, press tab, press enter, and it writes all your code for you, It's pretty cool. Uh, but I really like Visual Studio um, and stuck with that for as long as I could until I got my next job at Yelp, which was a Linux and Python shop. And uh, Visual Studio, well, for one, they wouldn't let us run Windows on our uh, development machines. I did try. I got it working. I got development of Yelp main working on my Windows machine for Hackathon once, just for lols. Uh, but it was super slow and like barely worked. Um, but I got I got Visual Studio proper running. This was long before VS Code existed. Um, but so I, I wanted some other IDE that worked pretty well, and so I switched to Eclipse at the time. And Eclipse mostly got the job done. Like it had fuzzy file search. I could get some amount of tab completion, and like it was it was pretty good for what I wanted. Um, then I switched to IntelliJ. This was before PyCharm existed as well. Uh, IntelliJ had some Python support. And it was pretty good. Uh, but then I went, uh, or I worked from home in, on the other side of the country for a couple weeks over Christmas. I usually go home for the holidays. Um, and during my time at home, uh, the code synchronization across the country was too slow to be functional. Uh, so I switched back to the terminal editor that I had learned in college, because I basically, I basically needed one just to, like, poke around with stuff. Um, and so I switched back to Nano, and during those like two and a half weeks, I developed a muscle memory, and I've been stuck with it ever since. Uh, that is, that is to say, or that isn't to say, is isn't to say. I don't know, whatever. Uh, I do know how to use Vim. Uh, I'm not a complete noob. Um, granted, I'm using the arrow keys, so I. <laughs> you can call me a noob. It's fine. Uh, but I, I know I know things. I know like sorting and oh god that sorted the whole file didn't want to do that look i can undo look at me uh this will sort those oh they're already sorted of course <laughs> i wanted to i don't know sort these ones no but i do know how to use vim uh i'm not 
a, a complete noob, um, but I'm I just for now I'm faster with Nano and like the muscle memory is all there, so I just stick with it. Wait, all that I hear from that story is that you're a noob. Yeah, I mean, look, I can quit them. Look at me. Uh, but yeah. Uh, do you like Windows subsystem for Linux or think it's insufficient? Uh, if you're gonna do console stuff, it works well. Anything with X Windows is gonna blow though. Uh, I have played with WSL a little bit. Um, it is, uh, at least from my experience, it was pretty slow. Uh, and the, the like terminal emulator stuff on Windows is it's getting there, but it's still like not quite where I want them to be. Um, so I, I haven't used it since then. Uh, and that was on my old computer. I still haven't even set it up on this computer because. No, I, I set up virtual environments and, and that works pretty well for me. <clears throat> but, um, I don't know, it, it works pretty well. Oh look, this process was run at exactly 1337, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Stupid things that I noticed. Uh, does anyone know if Steam's Photon Linux slash Windows game compatibility layer works well? I've heard that it works well. Uh, that's, I mean, I've only heard good things about the, the Steam stuff. Uh, it's basically like wine plus some other magic that makes it work pretty well. Like people are getting good frame rates and decent game compatibility, so I, I think it's pretty good. Uh, there's VS Code now too. Yeah, VS Code is pretty great. Uh, I use it on stream occasionally when people are like, you should use VS Code. And so I'll, I'll open it up and, and play with it. And we actually just spent some time debugging an import issue with someone's um, VS Code. Visual Studio Code is unable to watch for file changes in this large workspace. Can you tell me my workspace is large? Oh, it's probably because this directory has two whole Python virtualings in it. Anyway, yeah, I do use VS Code sometimes. Uh, I also switch between projects a lot, and so working directly in the terminal is, is like kind of faster for me to jump around all over the place and not, not have to worry so much about that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I feel like I'm making excuses for myself at this point. Man, now I'm terrified that I pre-commit and pie test my requirements to text. Well, <laughs> jokes on you. Jokes on you, bud. <laughs> so look what you've done. You're prompting me to go uninstall. Uh, uh. <laughs> uh, best item in Vim is block, copy, and paste. Uh, I do know. I think I know how to do that. Uh, let's see. Vim set up. Oh, CFG. So. Like visual line mode, and then yank, and then shift P. Yeah, look at that. Uh, I assume that's what you mean. Uh, and cut, which, uh, wait. So I'm teaching my brother how to program, and <laughs> I know how much people make fun of me for using Nano, so I'm actually teaching him to use Vim instead. And so we've both been learning a lot of Vim as we go along. Um, and so, like, I think recently, maybe it was yesterday? I think it was yesterday, actually, we went over Cut. Because uh, he's done Copy and Paste by Block, and he's he's getting really good at getting in and out of Insert mode, which uh, I always forget to do all the time. Uh, but Cut, I think, is D, and then it's, again, like, Shift-P for, for pasting. Um, but... Anyway, I, I kind of know how to use Vim. <laughs> I'm just not as fast at it. Uh, that's fair. It improves each year, but there are still Unicode rendering problems, and the latest improvements that the console team has added haven't really been included yet. Hmm. I guess that makes sense. Um, yeah, because last time I used Windows Subsystem for Linux uh, was during the preview period, and so it was it was very broken then. Um, I assume it's way better now, but I haven't haven't had a chance to look at it since then. Excuses, you definitely are, but that's okay. Yeah. Uh, doesn't say that many keystrokes. The dot operator, care, word, words, star, navigation, motions are the best parts of Vim. I'm not sure I understand the dot operator in Vim, uh, but that's because I'm a noob. But, um...
Where block copy, control shift V will start a block of arbitrary shape. Oh, like square copy. I see. Yeah. Um, I've used that before to do like, uh, if control shift V. Oh, wait, that's paste. Wait. Wait, control shift V. Oh, I'm in insert mode. I'm in nano. <laughs> I'm an insert mode. What is going on here? Control Shift V. You sure it's Control Shift V? The Shift V is visual line. Um, v is visual, which is not block, but um, collection. I think Control V is what you're referring to, which is like rectangle select. Rectangle select. And then, like, um, oh, control. And then you can do, like, change to, oh, wait. Did that wrong? I forget what the sequence is. But anyway, I've used that to re-indent stuff before. Oh, I think I did control V, select this, and then indent. Anyway. Uh, then, oh, the dot operator just redoes the last operator. Okay, cool. Square copy exists in most other editors. It doesn't exist in nano. <laughs> uh, it's meta or control V depending on your dot files. Yeah, mine are non-existent. I think I have, I have, yeah, I, I was helping my brother set up a flake eight plugin for Vim. And so this is all I have. Uh, I don't think I need this anymore. <laughs> look at this! Look at my VimRC, guys! It does one thing. I should have expand tab and the other stuff in here, because I definitely just put tab files into my base indented file, but whatever. Uh, typically if you hit Shift-I to type and then Escape to finalize. Oh, I see. Minimalism. Oh, would you be able to answer my question above about what to read slash follow? Oh, did I miss it? Oh. <laughs> what do you read slash follow to stay up to date on Python and what would you recommend for me? I've been programming for 20 plus years and I'm recently familiar with Python. Ooh, um, let's see. So sadly, a lot of the stuff that I get out of like changes in Python comes from either Twitter, um, which is pretty bad. And honestly, I don't read enough of Twitter to like make it useful. Um, the other stuff that I browse through periodically is the uh, Python, C Python, uh, is the, the pull request and issue lists of C Python, although this doesn't scale at all. Like um, <laughs> reading through these is usually just like kind of a kind of a shit show. Um, yeah, I, I also dislike that new info comes from Twitter because I like Twitter's just like a, a cesspool of spewing garbage repeatedly. Um, but I, I read through PRs a lot sometimes to get like understand little fixes and stuff like that. Um, the other thing that's really bad, but also something that I scroll through sometimes is the bug tracker. Uh, unfortunately, you have to like sort it by. I wonder how I do this. Usually I just like read the first page and like sometimes I'll like, I'll fix some stuff or, or whatever. Um, the other thing, like one that you can do to find major changes, and this one is this one's easy and, and low noise, um, is to follow the peps project on GitHub. This is where they propose large changes to Python. Um, and usually for this it's just like look for new files that get created here and like Follow, follow based on that. Uh, so like, see what was one of the more recent ones that they added? Nine months ago, two months ago. That was a typo. The recent one. F588. So this was around like typing and stuff. If I remember right. Uh, 
where it's not created yet. Anyway, um, the other thing that I do is uh, pay attention to, or like, I'll occasionally watch conference videos for stuff, and often like, those conference videos will have new information about stuff in the language, uh, or I'll attend them. Um, we also have, there's also some like meetups for specific interest groups, at least in the Bay Area. So one of the ones that I've uh, gone to a couple times, unfortunately I've missed the last like two or three of them, is um, the, uh, uh, there's a typing meetup where stuff with MyPy and stuff uh, gets together and meets and talks about like how we're going to improve the type system and all that other stuff and like um, how, how important that is to uh, um, know, adjusting the type system and making it a stronger type system and all that, all that other stuff. And so that stuff's pretty cool. Uh, how far ahead slash behind do you track the major minor versions? Like when are you going to start tracking 3.8? Uh, so I've already started feeling or like playing with Python 3.8. Um, partially because I maintain uh, Dead Snakes, which is an Ubuntu PPA that uh, backports and forward ports Python versions for old and new, um, old and new versions. What do you mean newer versions are available? Oh, I see. So someone up <laughs> upstream uploaded. 373.-2. Anyway, um, but yeah, I, I uh, maintain backports, so I've already created a backport for Python 3.8, um, so you can get like your solid, uh, your stupid walrus operator, which uh, allows you to have si assignment expressions, which I don't know, I'm kind of grumpy about. I think it was rushed slash forced into the language and um, Maybe not the best decision. Um, so like, I don't know. So like some of the, I've already noticed some of the changes and also I've had to fix some of my programs to support Python 3.8 already. Uh, but it's always good to like try stuff during alpha because you'll, you'll suss out some of the breakages early on. Um, but like, I think PyUpgrade had a fix or two for Python 3.8. Pretty sure I did this one on stream too. Issues? Python 3.8, many tests failing. <laughs> it wasn't wrong. Uh, but yeah, I had to like fix up some code for Python 3.8. Um, and since I provide backports, I can start using it directly in, in uh, testing and stuff. What the fuck? I didn't know about that operator. Assignment expression boolean validation is Terra bad. Yeah, like I, I feel like I've watched at least one or two talks where people are like, "Yeah, I'm so glad that Python doesn't have assignments in if statements because then it's super obvious what's going on." And that was a terrible thing about C. Blah blah blah. And then like, this this uh, expression got proposed and um, like um. Um, what am I saying? Yeah, it got proposed and like something like 90% of the core devs opposed it and it just kind of got like forced through by, by Guido and then um, and then Guido stepped down directly afterwards and it was it was a whole mess but like I don't, know, I don't I really don't think Python needs this. It might make some code simpler uh, but there's way more like potential for abuse here in my opinion um and it's like another thing that beginners are going to trip over because it's like it's really easy to to screw up what are you doing that's a good question maverick twitch uh i'm answering questions right now i think i was going to push a pr did i finish this did i push it to origin i did not push it <laughs> uh python wants to join the golang team yeah uh, please no. 
uh, I don't have a problem with Go. Go works. Um, this is a solid one line one line fix for the test um, to fix this bug here. Uh, and then hopefully I'll be able to move on to other issues that I've wanted to solve. Sorry for the distractions. Yeah, no big deal. Um, I honestly spend most of my team stream just like answering questions anyway, so it's it's completely fine. No thanks, I love Go, but let's let let Go be Go. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we we fixed this Windows bug. Um, we'll wait for CI to confirm that. Uh, uh, I should have pushed it to my other remote because right now it's gonna run all of the tests twice. <laughs> Well, actually four times, so twice on Linux and twice on AppBear, which uh, is going to take forever. Uh, at some point, I want to switch this to use Azure Pipelines, which has faster uh, Windows builders to make this less painful. Um, but I <laughs> I think that's kind of boring, so I'm probably not going to do that on stream. I'll probably do it off stream. Although I did it for some of my other projects on stream, because I was basically learning like how stuff is different here. Uh, but like I moved the pre-commit hooks repository over to to Azure Pipelines, and uh, it, it sped up the build by quite a lot because these used to happen in serial, and now they're all in parallel, which is pretty nice. Um, I can speed it up even further because right now uh, there's no caching in Azure Pipelines, and so there's a lot of work that keeps getting done over and over and over, which um, is is a little unfortunate. <laughs> Jokes aside, thank you very much for the contributions you're making to core stuff that the whole community benefits from. Is there a way that I can donate slash tip? Um, <laughs> this is actually the second time this has been asked this stream, and I don't have anything set up yet. Um, I'm going to try and I guess I'll do that after the stream and hopefully get some things set up. But like I haven't really thought about that as option yet. Um, there is an open collective set up for pre-commit, although um i haven't done anything with it yet and but it is a thing <laughs> this does exist um but i don't know I haven't, I haven't worked with it yet uh but to to answer your question no i don't have anything set up for donation slash tip yet but eventually i i will soon maybe <laughs> we'll see i'll try and get something set up um but that way, that way, future streams there'll be a an opportunity there. Um, just stop running tests for optimal CI time. Yeah, force push to master all the things. Uh, um, sorry, I just <laughs> someone in Slack posted um in one of our private channels that was like, "Hey, have you guys seen this job opportunity from Netflix?" And um, let's see, what was what was the job opportunity? It was like resilience engineer or some shit. Um, yeah, it was it was this this job position here, senior resilience engineer advocate. <laughs> and <laughs> me being a troll replied to it was like, um, "Are you going to apply?" But this is work slack, and so, <laughs> um, so. I'm pretty sure everyone realizes that I'm trolling, or I hope everyone realizes that I'm trolling, but, like, I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> and then, like, four or five people DM'd me with just, like, the fire emoji, which, uh, pretty good. Happy about that. Resilience engineer. Sounds like a scapegoat. Yeah. Especially resilience engineer advocate. Uh, this is, like, what is this, like, a buffer between the reliability engineer and the the actual developers. <laughs> I don't know, but rolling. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this one was like a like if we want to work on another issue, I'm gonna give this person a chance to work on this issue. So we'll we'll skip this. It should be pretty easy. Uh, they said they were gonna work on PR, so. Uh, I'm gonna let them work on that, hopefully. Resilience engineer, that sounds like a scapegoat. That means just getting yelled at. Yeah. 
Yeah, unfortunately, uh, oh, maybe I shouldn't talk about this on stream. We'll leave that for another day. We'll leave that for a spicier day. Um, but there's there's been some, like, problems with the uh, resilience organization at Lyft. We're, we're working those out. So hopefully that'll that'll improve. <laughs> there's uh there's some funny stories that I I'll tell another day. Um, the desk quite hasn't quite settled yet, so I'm gonna gonna save that one for another day. Drama feed us, maybe maybe another time. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, basically, I mean the the. The TLDR is uh, Lyft is trying to have a, resi a resilience organization that is more like embedded software engineers that have a focus on reliability. And unfortunately, when you hire senior developers from the industry as SREs, uh, they don't tend to see an SRE organization in the same light uh, because SRE at Google or Facebook or any of those like very large companies that have an SRE team tends to uh, tends to run SRE in a completely different fashion, um, and uh, we don't we don't really want that culture at Lyft. And there's been some transition problems. We're uh, we're working on it. You get to work on core tools and infra at Lyft or other stuff. Yeah, I work on so. Uh, I joined Lyft about a year and a half ago. I joined on the provisioning team, uh, and the, the responsibilities of the provisioning team were to uh, manage the development stack, the production stack, and uh, all of the developer tooling and stuff. And at the time, we were severely understaffed. There were like four of us for all like 400, 500 developers, and so it was like... A like hundred to one ratio of infra to non-infra engineer, and so like we were constantly like running around with our tails on fire, like working really hard to keep everything, keep the keep the uh, keep everyone happy and keep everything working. Um, but then we scaled up that team to like fourteen or fifteen people, uh, and then it split into several different teams. Uh, the team that I now run or like tech lead ish of. Uh, is a team called Developer Experience, which our focus is now purely on developer tooling and the developer environments and uh, making it so that developers are, in theory, productive. <laughs> it turns out that's a hard problem, but like we, we're trying our best. Um, but the, the thing that I really like about the team I'm on is I get to leverage a lot of open source tooling in Python and, in particular, a lot of open source tooling that I've written in Python. Um, it's, it's, it's like kind of my kind of my passion to work on like code quality tooling and that sort of stuff and I, I get a lot of opportunities to leverage that at Lyft. What's the enforced linting and PEP standards at Lyft as far as you can tell us? Um, yeah, so the, the answer to that is before a few weeks ago there weren't really much, there wasn't really much standardization on uh, like Python development at Lyft. Uh, like, there was a, a suggested template that included like running Flakegate and running like um, yeah, basically like there was a template that suggested running Flakegate and that was about it. Um, before I got there, that wasn't even in the template, so it was basically just like you can if you want to do linting, you can, um, but otherwise there's no requirement. Um, <laughs> you mean my boycott of Uber in favor of Lyft is being run by cowboy coders? Well, hold on, hold on. Well, we're getting to a better state. Let me, let me get there. Um, and so um, when I joined, I was like, holy shit, guys, we, we can't do this. Um, we, we need to run linters. Um, and so I set up some like, or like I adjusted the template so that there were better practices around linting. Um, that's not to say there wasn't any linting. There were centralized linters where if you wanted to opt into it, you could. Um, and some linters that were like, okay, here's how you can check for Python 2 and Python 3 compatibility. Uh, this will run Python modernized to automatically format your code and like all this stuff existed It was just like optional and, and not not like super required to work on uh, But recently we've been adding flake 8 to every repository at Lyft uh, So I recently did a thing where I added it to all 404 no 402 Python repositories at uh, 
at Lyft, um, which was, oh man, that was, that was quite the, uh, quite the adventure. So I had to use a lot of like code formatters and, and such in order to make, uh, Lint pass on some of the repositories. Uh, cause they were in various states of, oh, our team likes to use linters. So we already have linters involved and those ones were easy. Cause like everything already passed. Uh, but then some of them, it was, <laughs> Uh, there was one repository that had 18,000 lint failures, and uh, I guess there was one that had 21,000. We still want to fix that one. <laughs> but some of them were in, in various states of disrepair. But now we're running uh, Flake 8 in all the repositories. Um, all of our Python 2 repositories within the next couple of weeks uh, will be running uh, Python Modernize and Pilot Py3K to try and get them nudged towards Python 3 compatibility because uh, we're trying to we're, we're making a concerted effort to get to Python 3 by the end of the year before it becomes end of life um, most of our Python services are already running Python 3 which is good because if it wasn't if it wasn't most like I don't think we would make the effort to port we would probably either like rewrite or do something else although I think rewriting is huge waste of time especially when python 2 actually i mean it's it's pretty different than python 3 but it's it's not hard to, it's not super hard to make them compatible um but i've been working with tooling to make that easier um depending on the team that you talk to some teams have different uh linting setups than others and so like uh, for instance our dispatch team has been really good about uh adopting code formatters and import sorting and like uh i think they're using black so like um all of their code looks the same they don't bicker about style and in, in prs and all that works pretty well like we have a lot of mypy at lyft so we have a lot of type checking that's going on which is really good um I think someone measured recently and it's something like 53% of our repositories are using MyPy to do type checking um, at various like levels of partially typed. Like, uh, all of the all of the repos except for one for my team have 100% type coverage, which is pretty good. Um, I don't know, it depends on, on, on a team by team basis. Like, we want to encourage teams to have the ability to lint stuff, which was harder before. Uh, but now that they can just use pre-commit, it's super easy for them to like plug in their linters and uh, not ship them to production and like all sorts of other niceties. And be able to run them locally on their laptop and not have to muck around with Jenkins and a bunch of Docker containers just to like check code quality and stuff. Um, I was going to suggest if you would suggest black over flake eight. Um, so personally, I think, so I think black is a good thing. Um, like, don't get me wrong. Like black is, is a powerful piece of software and its goals are good. Um, I don't agree with some of its choices in formatting and I don't like that it will make, uh, it will reflow code when it doesn't need to, um, which can like, there are some cases where I have intentionally formatted code that will get rewritten. Um, but I don't really like the, the reflowing uh, part of like a, or sorry, part of black. Uh, but other than that, like, I think like black is a good idea. Now I don't disagree. Or I disagree with the double quotes. I disagree with the position of Boolean operators. Uh, I don't like the slices. Uh, I'm glad they got rid of the number formatting thing. Cause I didn't like that either. Um, and its rules about trailing commas are a bit wishy-washy, uh, in my opinion. But I do like its ideas. That said, like I use a different set of, of code formatters, and I've, I've gone over some of them earlier in the stream. I'll just give you a, a TLDR using the pre-commit configuration. Uh, but I use, I use a bunch of different code formatters to do basically the same thing, but uh, with each thing doing specific things. <laughs> you use nano, what do you know? All right, all right. Um, so I use a uh, a formatter that goes to single quotes instead of double quotes because uh, I really don't like pressing the shift key. Uh, I use flake eight to enforce linting. I use auto pet bait to fix basic white space errors. Uh, Pi upgrade is a tool which will take old versions of syntax and turn them into newer versions of syntax. So like normalizing set literals and 
uh, format strings and that sort of stuff. Uh, it also does a bunch of other things with uh, like Python 3 upgrading, uh, Python 2 bridge burning, that sort of thing. Uh, I use an import reorder that I wrote, uh, which does static analysis, whereas like iSort does dynamic analysis. Uh, and I also have my own trailing comma writing, but um, and those are the formatters I use. Hey, do you recommend Flatpak? I don't know that I've heard of Flatpak. Uh, I have never used Flatpak. Um, I don't know enough about it to answer that. Um, don't know, sorry. Uh, if I want to remove linting but keep IntelliSense, is that a thing? I think so. Let's see. Is it F1? <clears throat> Python enable linting. Current value is on. Let's turn it to off. See if we still get IntelliSense. There's a file. Yeah, this seems to still work. Let's see if it works for third-party libraries. Uh, I don't have the virtual env configured. F1. F1. Select interpreter. This one. Yeah, it seems to seems to work. Um, oh yeah, the the setting that I did for that was uh, Python enable linting, and I turned it to off. <laughs> um, so yeah, that would that would be how you would fix the or that would be how you would get uh, IntelliSense without um, without uh, PyLint being annoying. By the way, VS Code handles some of this stuff in your core Python language tools, for example, with Python imports. Uh, yeah, you can hook up different import sorters for VS Code. I'm aware of that. Um, but at the same time, like, I want to be able to enforce that in continuous integration and, like, don't want to force everyone, oh, well, your imports are ordered wrong, so please download VS Code and run an import sorter. No. <laughs> I feel like that's uh, not, so, not so great. Um, but yeah. Anyway, that's that's why that's the uh, set of formatters that I use. Um, yeah, within CI. So yeah, um, free commit allows you to run linters and formatters locally, but also like you can enforce them with continuous integration. And so like the way that we do that, uh, or the way that I do that in my open source projects is we just run free commit run dash dash all files as part of the uh, test suite. Uh, and that works pretty well. Uh, at work, the way we do this is we build a Docker image that has all of the pre-commit linters installed and then fake a git repo and then run it against all files in that um, so that we can run it in a uh, network isolated fashion. So basically like pre-download all of the linters uh, during the build phase and then run them at test time. Thank you, Joe Dahl, for following. Every follow counts. Look, me, this coverage is annoying. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Know that feel. Uh, I'm addicted to animal crackers, guys. I've had like one quarter of a family back today. <laughs> Yo, animal crackers are so good. I haven't had them in so long, partially because I don't even know where I would get them nowadays. My grocery, the grocery store that is closest to me doesn't sell them. I guess I could go to the further away one. JSON net. Oh no, why are the tests failing? Oh, because they typoed. I think this is meant to be text. I got them at Walmart. Yeah, there's no Walmarts around here. As a kid, I loved decapitating them first. Yeah, same. You gotta like. Start with the head, then go for the limbs, and the the bodies, bodies at the end. At least that's how I do. Know this person? Seems familiar. 
Well, they work at San Gray, maybe? No, they made like one patch to send grid. They work at Microsoft? No. Chinese word for nature. Hmm. Means that which happens. Person looks familiar. I don't know where from though. Your hair I don't know. grows by itself. Your heart beats by itself. Uh, but anyway, identify is the library that pre-commit uses to figure out what files are of what type and what to pass to stuff. Oh, that's such a nice code review reply. I would have put a kappa or something snappy, but I'm a goof. Yeah, so, um... I used to be a snarky code reviewer, uh, but then I got feedback in my review cycles that I should be less of a dick, and so I've, I've uh, tried to tone that back a little bit. But, I don't know. I feel like being as receptive as possible to people that you don't know is a, is a good way to encourage more contribution. Um, but yeah, I try and be nice. <laughs> One of my coworkers is so passive aggressive in reviews, it's kind of funny. I mean, there's, yeah. I definitely think it's funny to be like a little bit edgy in, uh, in, uh, code reviews. Like, if it's a person that I know will get a laugh out of it, I'll, I'll like, I'll meme in code reviews and people will think it's funny. Also, I have, um, I have a, uh, did I install it here? I did. I have a user extension that when I click on approve, it auto populates the, um, the approval message with a random GIF, um, <laughs> a random ship it GIF. And I've got, I've simply like somehow pissed off people by putting ship it GIFs in my, uh, code reviews, but this is this is the small hill that I will die on. I will let people get mad about about ship it gifts because I think they're hilarious. Um, but yeah, there's a there's a bunch that it chooses from. So this is a, probably a different one. Um, this one is just a cat that's like, oh no! But they they get sourced from this page. Login interface. Please don't let me log in. Yeah. So there's just like a bunch of cat gifts and such for ship it. This one's pretty creepy. Um, and then if <laughs> then there's some uh, don't ship it ones, which <laughs> are uh, are pretty good. Um, but anyway, if you guys have ship it gifts and want to contribute them, uh, github.com slash chriskeel slash not identify but ship it. So Want some uh, want some ship it gifts? I also included the user script there. So if you, if you want the user script? That's it's also there as well. Um, but on all on all GitHub pull requests, it looks for a click on the approve button, and then it'll pick a random URL from those. The stop sign one is funny. Yeah, <laughs> that one is pretty good. Uh, where's the URL again. Yeah, this one. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like so bad, but I laugh at it like every time. <laughs> uh, but I've definitely posted this on a code review before. It's just like, whoops. Oh, also I fixed the user script. <laughs> uh, the V1 would pick any image on this page and I accidentally posted um, this image on someone's code review. And uh, quickly, quickly fix that part. But like, uh, that was, that was, um, that was pretty bad. Fortunately, they were on my team, and they were like, "Did you mean to do that?" Like, like. <laughs> but anyway, that's my that's my code review snark for for stuff. My hobby horse is when someone makes a coding error because they are on OSX. I say something like, it appears you are using a toy operating system that is impairing your ability to code professionally. Please consider upgrading. <laughs> yeah, I I will occasionally go on rants about working on a crippled BSD operating system. And like, <clears throat> having really crappy tools. 
the number of times that I've like written a shell script that doesn't work on OS X and I'm like, ugh. Right, I have to target bash from the late 80s. Ugh. Alex Demo 26, 26 asks, do you know Kubernetes? Uh yeah. To some extent. Um we're we're actually migrating to Kubernetes at work right now. Um I have more familiarity with Mesos because uh, that's what we used at Yelp, uh, but they're basically the same system. That was not a confident yet. Yeah. Uh, so like I wouldn't consider myself an expert on Kubernetes. Uh, I do know about all of its concepts and their their ideas and like um, immutability containers, like having building blocks and um, and bin packing those like kind of ideas. And like I'm I'm familiar with the concept of pods and like how Kubernetes has its in my opinion, kind of strange uh, networking requirements and like the, the like design of like daemon sets versus sidecar pods and like all this sort of stuff. Like I, I know stuff about Kubernetes, but I, I'm not I'm not in any way an expert on Kubernetes. Um, I do know stuff about Mesos, but Mesos is like way simpler and definitely dying soon. Uh, no, Lyft is migrating from manually provisioned auto-scaling groups in AWS, where we essentially run uh, directly on the Amazon virtual machines. Uh, we're migrating from that to Kubernetes, so uh, we currently don't really do containers or immutable infrastructure, and so Kubernetes is a way for us to move to that. We desperately need it because uh, maintaining mutable infrastructure is really, really hard to get right. and um, we've definitely had like lots of, I don't want to say issues, but like stuff that would be non-problems in Kubernetes. Uh, wait, Kubernetes on AWS or another provider? We're moving, we're, uh, we're kind of, so we're going to run Kubernetes on AWS, uh, but we're not going to be using EKS, um, mostly because EKS is like, EKS is Amazon's, uh, Kubernetes product. We're using our own ENI plugin that um, has the networking bits for Kubernetes. Uh, and then we're running Kubernetes primitives directly on Fedora machines. Uh, well, F Fedora VMs in AWS, because they're technically not physical machines. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's actually working pretty well for us so far. Uh, Knock on wood, we haven't had any like major outages with it. Uh, although we did, <laughs> we did have an issue where somebody both scaled down and scaled up their service at the same time. Which, uh, when you migrate, you kind of don't want to do that because uh, if you don't scale up or don't scale down at the same rate, you'll lose hosts and like lose traffic. But that was that was a fun one. We've uh, we've since fixed that in our like migration runbook the biggest problem we've had. Uh, yeah, Google Cloud's Kubernetes is great. Uh, there was an effort to try and move some of Lyft's infra to GCP, uh, but all of our data stores are in AWS, so it was kind of hard for us to, um, hard to like kind of split brain multi-cloud. So it really wasn't like, there was a big effort to make a cross cloud data store thing, uh, but we ended up abandoning the effort because the latency was too high. Um, but I think I do think that like setting up Kubernetes in GCE would have been uh, GCP would have been way better. Google Cloud just released something to do cross cloud stuff. Yeah, we were doing some of that. Um, Gotta go, need more CPU. Oh no, sarcastic Dante. Uh, <laughs> thanks for stopping by. Um, have fun with your uh, C++ compilations. <laughs> that need all the CPU in the world. Um, oh, surely this has passed by now. Nope. Yeah, so this is like the huge problem with AppVair is like each of these, there's only two jobs that run for each of these, but they both run in serial um, and they each take like 10 minutes each. So in order for this to run end to end, like this alone is 40 minutes of, of linear time. Uh, and that's like the big reason that I want to switch to Azure because I can, for one, I can eliminate one of these runs by just building on um, PRs. 
but then I can paralyze this and all of these side by side so it's not taking up a bunch of linear CPU time but since this passed like I can just work but yeah woo I wrote 11 lines of code today guys I did it <laughs> We shouldn't be able to donate money to Precubit just to fund scaling the CI boxes. Uh, yeah, the problem is um, Atver's pricing plans really suck. Um, I did get opted into their Enterprise 10 account for a trial period once, and it was amazing. Um, but um, even their like $50 a month plan, or like $60 a month plan, uh, only allows one concurrent job. And even at a hundred dollars a month, you'd only get two concurrent jobs, which like that's just like fucking terrible. Uh, but the nice thing about Azure, which I'm hoping to switch the rest of my stuff to, uh, concurrency. Let's... Azure Pipeline supports Windows and Linux and macOS, and their free tier. Yeah, their, their free tier for public projects allows 10 free hosted parallel jobs, which uh, apparently can run to six hours each, but like I would never need that or want that. Uh, but this is better than Travis CI even. Travis CI only allows five parallel, uh, but Azure allows 10, and so far my use of it, I've been really impressed with their, their uh, products. Now granted, the setup is very tedious. Like I can, let me, I'll port one project just to show you how much work it is. Uh, let's see, all repos, find files, Travis.yml. Uh, what's something that I can move over? Um, let's do, I don't know. Pick a, pick a random project. Let's do this project. So right now I have a pretty simple Travis config for this. Like I'm just testing Python 2, Python 3, and PyPy. Uh, I don't think I'm testing at there here. Nope, so no no windows here, although I could add windows if I wanted to, but it's pretty easy to just switch over from there. Uh, let's see, I have to go to acedelay.visualstudio.com, so that's several clicks there. Then I need to click into, so uh, Azure Pipelines has like three levels of uh, grouping. So there's an organization level, which I have an organization called acedelay. Then there's a project level, which I have a project called acedelay. And then underneath the project, this button is broken, by the way, which is awesome. If I click this and then I click this button, now it works. I don't know why. Little little polish things needed there. Uh, then I can go to new build pipeline. I need to click GitHub. I need to say hastily slash seed I sort config. Then I need to click continue. YAML apply. I need to name it here again. Uh, seed I sort config. This dropdown doesn't do anything, uh, but I've left it alone before. Then I need to do save. Next part. This setting is invalid. What do you mean? Oh. Go here. Azure pipelines.yml. Now we can save that. Save and summary. Okay, so we're here. Now we can start setting up the PR for this. Uh, Azure pipelines dash b. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, and I've been using PyFrate as a template because this is the first one that I moved over. Uh, and I have this Azure Pipelines template set up, which allows me to kind of dedupe a lot of my configuration. Uh, CP pipe upgrade Azure Pipelines dot. And I don't care.
care about testing on Windows here, so I'm gonna get rid of that. I also don't care about testing all of these Python versions. Uh, so I can probably just get it down to these is good enough. Uh, and there's a newer tag release. I'm gonna switch to a newer tag release. Azure Pipeline Blitz. Latest release is 0.10. Let's do that. I need to grab these badges, replace the old badges, I need to change the build definition to be, there's a build definition, 20, 2 to 20, yes, 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 get rid of Travis, Comments. We added Python 3.7. That should be good now. Azure pipelines. Unknown switch M. Oh, it's status command. What am I doing? So. Got rid of the Travis config, moved the badges to Azure, added an Azure pipeline, and then deleted this comment that mentioned Travis. And then I should be able to push this and make a PR. And then once I create a PR, it should trigger a job uh, and skip Travis. Travis. But I don't want to run Travis CI on this. Because I'm deleting it. Get Travis, yeah, whatever. Uh, create PR. So this should trigger a build. Though I've seen it not trigger a build several times. And I have to like manually debug why that's happening. Do it, I believe. Yeah, there we go. So trigger the build. I gotta make sure this passes. The configuration's fine, so that part's good. Um, but then that runs. But anyway, that's a lot of work. <laughs> and then I have to go to Travis CI and disable that. Settings, the C to I sort config. Turn this off. Then I have to go to coveralls. I gotta turn that one off too. Um, Uh, where's the delete button? Oh, oh great! Well, I've exposed my code, my token there. Um, let me regen that off screen. <laughs> God damn it, coveralls! Uh, and I'm gonna delete it off screen too, because it also exposes my token again. But at least I rotated that, so no problem. But anyway, deleted deleted C I sort config on coveralls. Uh but then these will these will run to completion and hopefully pass. Once I pass I convert. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway. Uh so much scroll back to read. Let's see. Uh all these CI providers are effing price gouges, yeah. Contact Azure and ask for more since you're part of an open source project and they're all about that at the moment. Yeah, I probably should. Uh, CI CD meaning GitLab and Jenkins or Jenkins X for Kubernetes. Oh, so at work we use Jenkins and a little bit of uh, Jenkins on Kubernetes, but it's not Jenkins X, but it, no, it kind of works. Azure blows. They gave me half a million in credits, and we are still eventually moving off of them in favor of AWS. 
So that was mostly to do with their agility around Node.js deployments about three years ago. Hmm. It was most my most miserable DevOps experience, but I'm sure they've gotten better. Yeah, I feel like they have gotten better. Okay, this UI you're navigating through makes me think things have not actually gotten better. Yeah, the UI is a little clunky. Now because in Europe, Trump has done the Cloud Act. This is a big problem for us to go to AWS. Yeah, and I'm Trump. I don't want to be don't want to be political because it's easy to divide people. But like, holy shit. Um. Using a French cloud provider. There's platform nine hosted in the US as well. Yeah. OVH has gone Kubernetes since a few months with managed solutions. Small startups go on AWS in France when there's no strategic data. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, soon we're gonna need to have hosted machines in space at sea to get away from these countries and their silly legislations. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. We should, we should have our first cloud provider that's actually in, in space. Uh, should I be using talks? At work and home, I can generally enforce control the environments, but maybe it's still a good practice. Um, I mean, as a maintainer of talks, uh, I'll tell you that it does its job pretty well. Um, it's generally not targeted at people that know how to manage all of their environments pretty well. But it's pretty useful for like if you're hosting an open source project and you want uh, like a, a single workflow that everyone will go through and it's really easy to automate from that. Um, I use talks in all of my projects, but as you can see when I develop, I don't really don't I don't myself invoke talks all that often. Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, uh, but it it works. I mean, it works pretty well. Um, I think talks could be significantly simpler, like it does way too much right now, in my opinion. Uh, but like narrowing that down is kind of a hard thing. Uh, a lot of people are here as usual, right on schedule. Uh, but I don't know. Tox is, Tox is pretty good. Oh, music stopped again. What are you doing? Oh no, it's just quiet. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's we don't we don't use it at Lyft. Uh, we used it heavily at Yelp, and it was it was really good for new developers to uh, learn a, a workflow that they could play with. Um, but yeah, we don't we don't use it at Lyft, unfortunately. Coveralls is cool. I haven't seen this. Uh, yeah, coveralls is pretty cool. Um, it doesn't work well with Azure pipelines right now due to the way the tokens are handled. <laughs> yeah, someone has clipped my token. Uh, but yeah, I rotated that token, so hopefully it's not a problem anymore. Uh, Excellent secret key rotation strategy. Yeah, that's one really shitty thing about the coveralls UI is um, they expose your token everywhere. And so, uh, as you can tell, I've uh, this is not the first time I've I've <laughs> leaked bat spe specific token on stream. But fortunately, it's just like easy to rotate. And I think they only use it to look at the code, so it's a read-only token. Hopefully, that's what I'm telling myself. Uh, that's not a good design uh, design choice on their end. Yeah, I agree. Who has Bitcoin here? I don't have any Bitcoin. Uh, I think crypto is a bit of a scam, but um, that's just me. Uh, let's see, I have a few Bitcoin bought years ago and have been holding. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I had a chance to buy Bitcoin when it was like 50 bucks. Um, in hindsight, I probably should have, but whatever. Um, I was a poor college student, and so that gamble did not really line up well in my favor. Oh, if you're a tox maintainer, I asked the wrong question. <laughs> I'm everywhere. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, OVH has two US locations, but it's pretty expensive compared to others. Hmm, interesting. I have actually never heard of OVH. Although from chat, I understand that they're a cloud provider. Translate this page. No, we'll just leave it in French. Okay with that. Oh, they do have two U.S. locations. This is actually quite a lot of data centers. I'm kind of surprised. Oh, they have photos of them too. I love data center photos. This one's kind of boring though. What? Why is this not? Why? Oh, I literally opened a image in a new tab. Great. Um, this one looks cool though. I like the design here. Hey, what's up? How's your... You, you see Suvacho? 
<laughs> I, but I butcher that every time. I'm so sorry. Pretty sure you can't nano a BTC incompatibility. Yeah, probably fair. Although you can like do the the Bitcoin computation by hand. Um, so in theory, in theory you could mine in nano. I don't know why you would want to, but you could. Uh, but anyway, that's that's how you can convert a repo from Travis to Azure pipelines with with all those clicks. Uh, and then you have to wait for this to become green. This link to the right place? Yeah, it did. No, it didn't. Maybe it did. I don't know. Oh, yeah, this has to pass. Okay. But anyway, it's a little bit tedious to switch to Azure, and I've been slowly doing it, but like, I think only like 10 of my projects have been moved over. Or maybe 20, that's what that number is. All repos. Pull this one. Uh, all repos find files, Azure pipelines. Yeah. So subtract two for PyTest and talks. And we have 19 projects that I've moved over so far. Um, but if we look at like Travis.yaml. I have, oh, that's actually a pretty good ratio. Um, I guess I've moved 20 out of 70, so like two sevenths is 28.57%. Yeah, 28.57%, so I don't know, 30% of the way there is not bad. <laughs> I watched a YouTube video of some engineer at a data center. It was pretty cool to watch. I was surprised it was above ground. I was under the impression being subterraneous was standard for cooling and geological disaster reasons. But it looks like lots of data centers are above ground. Uh, yeah, the only one, let's see. Yeah, the only data center that I've been to was at uh, the University of Michigan, um, which was a multi-purpose data center. Like half it was the uh, shared compute for the CS department, and the other half was like Google search uh, appliances and Oracle databases. So like half of the data center was super organized, but the other half was just like, here's these random boxes from third-party providers that we've jammed into, uh, jammed into this data center space. But like the amount of security was crazy. Like uh, the person that let us in had to go through like a like a retina scanner. We had to like sign a whole bunch of like NDAs and papers. And I guess now that I'm telling you about those, I probably violated those, but it was forever ago and all that hardware is irrelevant now. But, um, but it, was a, it was a pretty cool experience. It was very like, it was very loud. Uh, like the, the amount of fans was just crazy. Uh, it was pretty cool in there though. Like uh, the data center wasn't running very hot, but it was, it was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I've never seen a data center underground. This one was like partially underground. Like uh, there was one floor that was underground, one floor that was above ground. Uh, I think the coolest part of the data center was the like uh, emergency backup turbine system where like they had enough fuel on site to run for like two and a half weeks without power or something ridiculous. And ha most of their fuel was to run this like giant spinning turbine that would use its like spinning, uh, its angular momentum to keep generating electricity even after the fuel ran out. And so you would get like another, another 10 to 15 minutes of like uptime there. But I don't know, it was, it was pretty cool. Uh, data centers are awesome. I wish I could visit more of them. Some developments in blockchain can host web features, not only data and code, it will be magic. Hmm, I don't know. I feel like I feel like the amount of electricity we've spent on blockchain and related things is kind of kind of a lot of work. U37J posts this giant hex in the channel. I don't know what this is about? Is this your like wallet address? Weren't there some underwater data centers? Not that I know of. Maybe. Well, I, I don't know of any, but I'm sure there are. Under ice data centers. Yeah, that would be uh, be clever. 
There's a data center under the desert. Data centers in the deserts. <laughs> Sounds counterintuitive, yeah. Exactly. Huh. I guess that makes sense. Dryness is a good thing, yeah. And you could get like solar power probably there. Or nuclear power even. That makes sense. Does solar play a part? Maybe. Uh ten years ago in this article, so it, it must be reality now. Yeah. Oh yeah, this is two thousand nine. It was like right after I graduated high school. Uh alright, I gotta go. This has been great. Thank you, I'll be back and maybe try to contribute to Precommit later. Yeah, thanks for stopping by, Philip. Uh hope to see you around. Um But yeah, let's uh hmm. Your job migrate into hardware, then you'll get to visit some data centers. Yeah, that's true. X solved, welcome you will be. Uh, is this a puzzle that you want me to solve? Oh, here we go. Uh, oh, that's Octal. This is big ass number. Um, I want. I do this. When did I do this? I did this before. Let me find that project. Uh, when I was playing with public key crypto. My GitHub page will load. Uh, actually, I can find it. I know I was using the socket module. Find it from there. SSH agent Python. Sign and verify one. Okay, so we got this giant integer here. Then what did we do? Coded stir codex.decode decoded hex. Oh, we turned the integer into hex. We went back to hex. So we can start just start with hex. Do this string here, and we need to codex decode that with hex. Uh, codex, I'm gonna regret this. <laughs> I already know this is gonna be something, probably gonna be something vulgar. And then, uh, so I'm gonna do this off screen, <laughs> just for safety reasons. <laughs> oh, it's a paste bin. Okay, so that's that's uh, that gets us to the next level. To a paste bin, uh, which I'm gonna open that off screen too. <laughs> oh boy, how deep does this rabbit hole go? So it leads us to this paste bin, which is a bunch more hex codes. Um, let's just do one of these. What could be wrong with one of them? Four characters. Is that <sighs> down the fucking rabbit hole we go It's 
So that's a base 64 thing. And I'm going to do this one off screen. Because I've fallen for this before. Fuck, it's more hex. <laughs> Okay, more hex. <sighs> Just grab this. It's the next level. Okay, so we have another hex string. I'm gonna do this again off screen. How many levels does this go? Or base 64. We'll get the payoff eventually. Uh, base 64 dot B64 decode. Okay. Now we have a SoundCloud link. I hope it's like Rickroll at the end. That would be just like pretty great. It's Rickroll. So this is the SoundCloud link, which I, which I assume is um oh stop 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 stop. Which is uh it looks like um given this it's what is that called? code. Copy that. Morse code decoder. That's weird. Why did it? Okay. I'm gonna do this off screen. <laughs> I, I assume it's just gonna be terrible at the end. Um, Okay, well, it's not terrible yet. Remove the question marks. Those are spaces. Um, more hex. So we have this now. It's a fun puzzle. It's a little repetitive now, but... Oh my god. <laughs> More base 64. <laughs> I hope this is the end, because... Holy shit. Sonic Visualizer. Is this, is this the bottom of the rabbit hole? U3, 7J. Is this the bottom of the rabbit hole? I feel like it's not. No? Yeah, I didn't think so. My guess is I need to use a sonic visualizer to look at this in... Um, look at this. <clears throat> but I don't know how to download from SoundCloud. <clears throat> SoundCloud downloader. I wonder if I can get a sound visualizer online. Content. 
course. Oh, and it redirects to HTTPS. Damn it. It on GitHub. It has so many forks. How has no one fixed this yet? Oh, it is fixed. Fuck. In 2018? Why is this not working? I'm working on Chrome. Mixed content. Upload. This is fixed. This should just need to be updated on the demo site. Get a repo link in the description. Perfect. A working demo. This is the not working demo, right? Yeah, that's not working demo. their HTML. Oh, it didn't download all the things. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna do W. Get one of my repos for this. you get recursive? Oh god, no, I don't want to download your entire blog. No, thank you. Invalid state error. An attempt is made to use an object that is not or is no longer unusable. I feel like this is a real annoying capture the flag. <laughs> These look cool, but not what I need. Online visual. Uh. Did you solve the CTF? No. <laughs> I got to the point where it's told me to use a sonic visualizer. And I don't want to download one. But my guess is there's a wave pattern in the You know what? 
this one's free, we'll use it. Play some Von Hub. Not that I've heard of Von Hub. Oh, it's like a uh, capture the flag kind of game. I can ever float for beginners one. Interesting. I want to finish this up though. I want to. I want to get this working. Installing software. Computing space requirements. Oh, somebody asked me about my PC specs, and I didn't answer that. I'm sorry, my micro PP. <laughs> Oh, there we go. That's that's gonna get clipped. Um, uh, what are my PC specs? Um, so I have a what is my CPU? I have an 8700K um, i7 processor. I have 64 gigs of uh, DDR4. I don't remember. Oh, where can I get my PC specs? Let me see. I know I sent them in Slack. Let me see if I can find the link to my part builder, although the prices have all changed. From me to Jake. Oh, I never finished the build here. Let's see how out of date this was when I finished it. So this is the processor I got. I got a liquid cooler. Uh, this is the motherboard that I bought. This is the RAM that I purchased. Uh, oh, it doesn't include all of my drives. Um, so I got a 970 Pro and a, oh, that one's unlabeled, and an Intel uh, NVMe drive, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then I have a 1080 Ti and this case and this um, power supply. But yeah, that's my, my specs. A little bit over the top, but um, I figured why not. I uh, also have photos of my computer build. There's that build. Like this is my old computer before. See, can you guys see that on stream? Yeah. Oh no, you can't. Dang it. Okay. This is my previous computer that died uh, right before I was going, or right after I was going to stream. Um, and so I was like, well, I need a computer, so I'm gonna order parts and Amazon Prime them and uh, build build what we need to build. Uh, so these are the parts that I recovered from the old computer. I didn't end up using this drive, so I actually have no uh, I have no disk drives in my new computer. This is my old SSD and my old hard drive, uh, which I have in my computer, but I don't use it for anything because it's loud and annoying. Uh, this is the obligatory parts pick before I put things in. Um, the NVMe drives I ordered separately and put them in later, so I don't have that um, pictured here. Uh, but this is the case, which is a not not a super conventional case. That uh, is probably the weirdest case I've used so far. It's kind of square-ish, uh, but it's kind of kind of cool. Uh, this is when I started putting things in. I think the motherboard's in in this picture. Yeah, there's the there's the motherboard. Processor's in, RAM is in, uh, what is that called? Power supply. This is my laptop talking to people. Uh, this is the slowly, slowly getting worse and worse state of my living room. Uh, this is when I had the liquid cooler in, although at this point, and I didn't realize it, I had the liquid cooler in backwards. Um, so I had to take everything out and put it back in, which was a royal pain. Um, because it turns out there's like a USB port right here that you have to plug into the motherboard, but, um, oh wait, no, maybe this is after I fixed it. No, this is after I fixed it, because here's the USB thing. Uh, but I originally put it in backwards, like an idiot. Uh, this is the graphics card in. That thing was so heavy. It's still, like, kind of, uh, leaning over a little bit. Like, it doesn't quite prop up nicely, but it was heavy. Uh, this is more of the disaster in my living room. Hey, what's up, Rectangle Potato? Thank you for the follow. Um, pretty surprising that you ended up 
as a rectangle, as uh, potatoes are usually not rectangular, but more power to you, I guess. Uh, but yeah, this is the uh, disaster that my living room got into. Oh, this is my old screen, um, which I still use. This is the, the one that's in front of me right now, which is a... Uh, this is what I spent all of my money on in high school. Uh, it's a 30-inch Dell that runs at 2560 by 1600. Um, and when I originally bought this monitor, I spent uh, $1,100 on it, and that was all of my high school savings. And then I realized, oh shit, I don't actually have a computer that's powerful enough to power this. And so then uh, I built my first computer and went into debt um, that I quickly paid off. <laughs> That's that monitor. I still use it today. It's still really great. Uh, thank you, U37J, for the follow. Every follow counts. I promise I'll get to your uh, capture the flag after this. Um, please don't make fun of my wiring. Uh, I did eventually clean it up later, but you won't see it in any of these photos. Uh, oh, and I mixed some, missed someone. Thank you, Alex Demo 26 for the follow. Every follow counts. I clicked on both of them at the same time. Sorry, did that out of order. <laughs> my bad. Um, this is that. Um, I did clean up the wires later, so yeah, they are they are better, <laughs> and they're really bad here. Oh, you guys can't even see all of them because they're off screen. But I did clean up these wires later. So I cleaned up these wires later, uh, but this is kind of like the final picture. Still, I, I reorganized the wires. Also, there's now an NVMe drive that sits right here, and there's one that you can't see that's underneath here. Um, NVMe is, is uh, super blazingly fast. SSDs are great. Thank you, Crack... Crackato... Crackatoid? Crack. Thank you, Crack, for the uh, follow. Every follow counts. NVMe is magic. Yeah, it's so, so fast. It's hilarious. It's hilariously fast. Uh, but yeah, and this is... This is the uh, desk that I'm sitting at right now. Uh, no idea why my checkbook is in this photo, uh, which actually that reminds me, I need to pay rent. So I'm gonna get my checkbook out. Maybe I had to pay rent then too, and that's why I was out. Um, but this is my setup. This is a 4K monitor that uh, I put like my stream dashboard and the music and all my other stuff on. And um, this is so, this portion right here on the monitor is where uh, my streamable content is. I put OBS down in this corner over here and chats over here. But that's that's my setup. Uh, this is my, my camera that I got forever ago. It's not particularly good, but it uh, gets the job done. So that's how, that's how you guys can see me. Um, and this is my microphone that I have to put pretty far away because otherwise it just like blows out everything that I say, um, because I am not good at tuning microphones, so I haven't, haven't fixed that yet, uh, but that's, that's my, uh, that's my computer setup. Uh, oh, and there's, there's lights on the inside that light up. Also, let's show it on. Yeah, there's, there's more lights when it's on. I think the lights are kind of annoying and a little bit tacky, but I don't know. I just deal with it. Fine. Uh, and this is with the screens on. You can kind of, kind of see what's going on there. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> this is, this is the aftermath of, uh, my, uh, my living room. There's my, my bike that I spent a lot of time on. Here's my exercise bike that I also spent a lot of time on. Um, my empty bookshelf, uh, <laughs> my fold-out couch. Anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's my, uh, disaster. But that's, uh, that's my photo of my builds. Uh, let's see. Oh, I gotta catch up on a bunch of stuff. This is a monster. Yeah, it is a bit of a monster. I have a Bi Xeon with 128 gigs of RAM and with KVM and every version of Kubernetes. Works like a charm. Holy shit. That's, that's a monster. That's an actual monster. Um, nice bike. Thanks. I've been looking for this case online. Are you in Europe? No, I'm in California. Um, but I don't know. Where did this go? Uh, did I close? Uh, oh, I closed the window. Um, but yeah, I, I ordered this on Amazon. It's a really easy case to build as well. Um, like it's the the parts all fit in nicely, and you don't have any of those like weird angles where you have to like shove the video card in and like dodge stuff. So that part's pretty nice. 
Thank you, Coding Decoding, for the follow. Every follow counts. Uh, all right, let's get to this sound sonic visualizer thing. Hopefully, hopefully get to the bottom of this uh, CTF. What are you doing, setup? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rubber stamp all the way to prod. Uh, hey, sonic visualizer. Welcome to Sonic Visualizer, blah, 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 blah. Sonic Visualizer would like permission to use the network. Mm. Mm. Nah, I'm good. I'm glad they asked first, though. Okay, open Visualizer. We downloaded. Did we download? I thought we did. Uh, apparently not. Download track. Uh, did we not download? Where did we download to? Chrome, what are, what are you doing? Download a folder. Oh, it's in my downloads folder, of course. Uh, of course. Right. A song or not dot mp3. Audio required. Uh, please load at least one. Unable to load layer data from this without an audio file. What does that mean? Is this not an MP3? Uh, open with VLC. Oh, well that, that would be why that's not a valid. Uh, download manually. Forbidden. Okay, well. Why that uh, didn't work. On this date, it is working perfectly now. Um, okay, that worked. And this one's on the desktop. I'm not not seeing it, guys. <laughs> Where's the like? How do I how do I separate this? Layer add spectrograph. Okay. Add spectrograph. Uh. Oh, I do see some what looks like text there. Maybe. Or is this supposed to be text down there? Let me make it bigger so I can... Oh, that's not... Done. Oh, there's a URL at the bottom. Uh, it's really hard to see though. Uh, but this is a URL down here. Change the settings on the right to make it easier to see. Like, scroll through these ones. Let me, I'm gonna make it big, you guys won't be able to see it, but then I'll take a screenshot of it afterwards. Uh. Oh, this is probably gonna be the most readable one. something.com https something.com slash something slash something <laughs> can't see it though uh all bins can i change it to just the lower bins uh what does this do 
Uh, that seems to make it harder to read. Oh, that makes it way harder to read. Four, one twenty eight. What does this do? <laughs> Nothing. Peaks, all bins, frequency, algorithmic. That looks like a thing now. Oh yeah, feel free to send links. Um, try these. Okay, white on black. White on black. Pale linear. Oh, that looks way better. Um, 2048. And 90 and 8x. What was the other settings? All bins and log. That's what I have. I feel like it was slightly more readable with. Um... Oh, wait. No, that didn't change anything. <laughs> it's so close. Uh... Uh... <laughs> it's so close to being readable, but it's just not, still just not, fruit salad. Well, that does nothing. <laughs> uh, it's a cool program, though. It's a nice uh, color scheme. Ghostbin.com slash paste slash letter before 99 is wrong. Oh, but this link is almost right. Let's just guess. What is this? What are you doing? Stop. <laughs> Guess other letters here. Well, that's different. Is this it? <laughs> Why do we have a bunch of flip text here? That looks like base sixty four flip text. This is backwards, right? Your U37. Oh no, that's your that's your handle. Oh, okay, we're done with this. <sighs> I have no reason to trust you, but I'm gonna just start trusting you and doing these directly. <sighs> and I'm gonna regret it, but it's gonna happen. This text is upside down. Oh, cool. Surprise. <laughs> Um, so fortunately, I have an IRC channel which has a flip text in it. Uh, I forget how to do it. There we go. Um, it did not flip it properly though. Oh, because it doesn't have the right Unicode in it? Okay. <laughs> Am I really going to type this out by hand? Flip text. Damn it. <laughs> uh, Alright, well, I'm going to manually type this out, so I'm going to copy this. 
off screen. Oh, I guess I can copy this text and then do it in Nano. Uh, so we can just do a mapping, right? Oh, uh, there's gonna be 64 combinations. Okay, C, M, capital F, capital M, capital V. Uh, that looks like an L. We're gonna go with L. Oh, but it's still L. Uh, I guess it's flipped is the same. N flipped is the same. 9 becomes a 6. W. S flipped is still an S? No, it's a Z. I don't know. <laughs> this is the characters that are upside down. I can definitely tell that. I'll be back in more than one minute and less than five minutes. I see. Is there a better flip text than this one? Because typing this out by hand is never going to happen. I'm not doing that. Oh, this seems to have done it correctly. So we have another base 64 text. Which decoded to binary garbage. Maybe. Yeah, that looks like garbage. Let's double check this and see what it looks like. Oh, maybe this is flipped and reversed, so maybe. That looks at least slightly more ASCII. <laughs> Why are there equals equals at the end? Uh, they don't actually do anything. I remember right uh but it's just like a boundary identifier for base 64. it's a good way to like indicate that it's base 64 uh just at a glance this looks like plain more plain text there's still like a weird uh non-breaking space here and a non-breaking space here and some weird bytes here and they're not utf8 Never. A bytes like object is required, not stir. Oh, do we already have? We had a bytes object. Mean. N must be none or string, not bytes. Fine, we won't use print then. Yeah, not, not helpful. Uh, but I think I flipped the text. Uh, is it is the text supposed to be reversed also? Because this is what happened when I flipped it. Uh, which A, J, R, E. This could be an O or a zero. Oh, that's what it is. But it still gave me like, so it gave me like these garbled bytes when I did it flipped and reversed. But then when I, or it's just flipped. Then when I flip reversed it, I got this out, which has this repeated ravzvil. Uh, X. <laughs> I don't know. I th I think I'm losing losing some data here. Like this flip text seems close, but not quite right. Oh. Can, can has hint. <laughs> Unless I'm just gonna try more and more flip texts until we get this. I'm just really hoping this ends up at Rickroll at the end. You didn't flip it though.
flip text. It didn't work. Uh, so you 37 today, which flip texter should I use? Because most of these are not working. Maybe the O and the zero is what's been bothering you. Uh, I mean, it's possible, but I don't think, like, even with the O and the zero, I don't think this is still that great. Or I, I still don't think it fixes it completely. In your last result, there's a repeating, repeating pattern. Yeah, I did see that. I saw this chunk and then this chunk here. The ampersand and this ampersand. But it only repeats twice. Don't see anything else that looks the same. And it doesn't look like a YouTube link. Where's my Rickroll? Um, I view a YouTube video. <laughs> Why are my suggestions garbage? <laughs> oh, it's because I don't use this account. I guess it's just an offset issue in the base 640 code if you have something repeating which is not readable. Yeah, that could be it. So I could do like incorrect padding. Uh, no, it's just like way worse if I slice it. This just, what did this just do? Just change the end of it. Oh no, we just chopped bytes from the beginning. Still same thing, different different garbage in the other way. Oh the yeah, I could try the different combinations with with um Incorrect padding. <sighs> seems, seems no. Wait, what? Oh, I need the padding on the end. Might have been some data loss or something when I made it upside down. Yeah, that's what it that's what it's looking like. Um Congrats, you've created a one-way cipher. <laughs> uh I'll fix the link one sec. Alright. Uh I will I will uh, wait for that. Uh, it's been a good puzzle so far. Uh, this last video got a lot of views. This was a really cool stream if you guys want to check it out. Uh, this was the stream I did on Tuesday uh, where I found and fixed a memory leak in Vexoig, which is how Flask does its uh, uh, frameworky stuff. But yeah, we've gotten pretty pretty far through this. Um, uh, 
but we can close some tabs now. But I'm, I'm really hoping that there's a Rickroll at the end of the rainbow, because uh, that would be, that'd be, that'd be good. Clicking on my email. Oh, it's just Travis CI sending me an email. Your tests are done. Thanks, Travis. Fix that. Um, this is one that I've wanted to implement for a long time in pre-commit. Refresh the URL. This is all caps though. Oops. It looks like base sixty four, but Clearly not. <laughs> Unless it's UTF8. Bunch of emojis. Caesar cipher, maybe? I could rot 13 it. That doesn't look like it helped. Oh, it's base, but not 64. Uh. Let's try base 16. Uh. Or 32. Oh, it looks like it's 32. Oh good, we're back to hex codes. And back to base 64. How long did it take you to set this up? Holy shit. Who we have now? What is that URL? <laughs> right? I don't I don't know, Mindful Fox. We're we're down a we're down a rabbit hole. We're on a very, very deep rabbit hole. Considering you're not even halfway. Oh my god. Fuck this. <laughs> I don't think we're ever gonna finish this. <laughs> but what is this encoding? program that iterates through bases and decodes. Base 7? How is this base 7? This is the current text we have. <laughs> uh, 
This doesn't look like an encoding that I've seen before. Oh, invalid character at position seven. This is backslash here. One, two, three, five. Oh wait. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, it's just backslash. I don't I don't know what this is. I don't know what this encoding is. And if I'm only halfway through, then I am tired. <laughs> Alright, bud, what is what is this encoding? Andor just paste Rickroll in chat and then I will I will be gotten. And uh we can we can end it there. <laughs> Base 37. Oh, like this would have to be more than 64 because there are capitals, lowercase, and many symbols. It's not base. Hmm. Is it like a shift encoding? No. Those are at least valid characters. Try. Let's try that. Well, this is a zero. <laughs> that doesn't help. <laughs> Octal wouldn't help either. There's too many. There's too much in this character set. Um, it's like it has to be at least base sixty four. Like it's not base, but it has to be at least. Um, at least that person obviously wants you to loop through them. Yeah. Um. But I I don't know what the encoding is here. Like I think the backslash is is a key is a hint here. I don't know. I got nothing. What's what's the what's the next level of U thirty seven J? Like my guess would be a Caesar cipher, but It doesn't appear to be that. Especially if this is a shift of zero, and uh, like my my guess is that each chunk would be shifted by this number. 
but I, I don't think that's correct. This is what it would be if we shifted everything. Is this decryption? <laughs> I don't I don't know. Oh, this is seven, but I need it to be Potentially our new string, although the end of the string didn't change. I don't know what's what's the uh, what's the next one. I give up. Uh, we're we're so far down this rabbit hole. Just paste it into all of these and see what's up. What could go wrong? Same. This is your encoded or decoded text, MR. Wrong. Not helpful. Here you looked at A64. We would have to have a key for this one, so it's probably not that. Speed. Well, we don't have a key, so. We know it's not rot 13, because that did nothing. We don't have a key here either, do we? Yeah, we would need a key. What was I clicking on? We did Morse earlier, but this is not Morse. Letter number cipher. Hmm. See that a long time ago? One time pad. Oh, do I maybe have to shift everything down by a certain amount? Or up? Oh, I've broken my terminal. Great. 
close X before we lose it. Zip compression? Maybe. This is... Zip. Uh, probably not G Zip. Use John the Ripper. <laughs> Alright, no quotes found. Great. Yeah, anyway, I think I'm I'm done with this. <laughs> Unless someone wants to give me a hint. Um I'm I'm done guessing. I'm gonna go back to writing code. In case I lose it, here's the uh, here's the last string that I ended up with. <clears throat> so if you guys want to play the game, there's a string. <laughs> um, I'll leave a note for myself to uninstall the uh, uh, Sonic Analyzer. I'll uninstall that later off stream. This one I want to get done. There's some work started on it. What's this string for? It's been this like crazy rabbit hole that started with a hex string an hour and a half ago like an hour ago let's see where was it um yeah it started with this hex string here and we've encoded and decoded it a bajillion times and uh u37j says that at the at the end of <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even halfway through the progression to figuring it out um but that's as far as i got before um just saying, uh, I'm done. <laughs> I'm not gonna find any further. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's some encoded message in some way or another. Um, we've already jumped through like four or five mediums and two or three different paste bins and. <laughs> which actually i've been streaming for four and a half hours so i'm probably gonna wrap up pretty soon um i wanted to see if there's something i can do quickly before calling it um this one is a uh, is someone who watches the stream sometimes um but they haven't looked at this in almost a month so I might finish it for them. What are you working on? Um, 
Um, my plan for this stream was to fix a bunch of things for pre-commit, which is a uh, linter runner and get hooks framer. I finished one thing and have spent most of the rest of the stream either answering questions or going down a rabbit hole of trying to solve a uh, crypto problem. Um, but I've got a new point where I'm, I'm stumped on the crypto problem and so moving on to other stuff. Wow, there's exactly 500 closed issues on pre-commit. That's kind of cool. Means there's about 500 PRs closed. For what language? Oh, for the crypto thing or for uh, pre-commit? Pre-commit's written in Python, although it works with Git hooks in a bunch of different programming languages uh, and knows how to like install them and manage their environments and all that stuff. Um, like here's some of some of the languages that it supports, but you can also use it for tools in whatever language you want to work on. Uh, but the crypto problem was just like a language agnostic problem, a lot of like base 64 encoding and such. Um, but uh, yeah, Pregament knows how to build and install in all of these different programming languages, which is part of the uh, part of the beauty of how it works and like. You don't have to worry about managing any of these environments yourself. It will just install them for you. But that's what makes it pretty cool. The new Boston, are you related to the YouTube channel? There's a YouTube channel. Tons of sweet computer related tutorials. What's going on, guys? My name is Bucky Robert. There's a. Uh... Wow. 2.2 million subscribers. That's a lot. If that's your channel, then GG. <laughs> I'm I'm a small fry. <laughs> no Java. Yeah, we haven't. I don't know enough about building Java yet to make it happen. Although I assume it's really just like run Maven and then it's good. Um, that said, there have been some people that have written some hooks in Java. Um, their hooks are. Uh, the, the way they work is the first run they manually download some stuff and then cache it somewhere and then after that it's fast. Uh, but Pregamate doesn't have any support for that. Or like out of the box support for that. But save one day. It's easy to contribute as well. There's like kind of a guide here on, at least I wrote up kind of a guide on how to write a new language. Um, this one was particularly talking about R, but I don't know enough about R to answer it. but. Uh, this talks about each of the different um, like bits of pre-commit and like which uh, parts do what things and and how to how to write a language for them. I forget what the last language that got added. I just look. I think it was Rust was the most recent one. But the API for this is pretty simple. Like you start with uh, this install environment hook, which. Uh, Rust had to do some magical things to make additional dependencies work correctly. Um, but then at the end, it's just like cargo install and that's that's it. Um, and then for the, the runtime, it's just like a modification of path, which there's this like env patching library that makes that a little bit easier to work with. And then almost all of the hooks end in these three lines, or all of the languages end in these three lines here. But, I don't know, writing, <laughs> adding a whole language support on stream after I've been streaming for almost five or four and a half hours is uh, a little bit out of scope. Um, but yeah, someone else recently asked about .NET and like adding .NET would be uh, similar. But, haven't, haven't done .NET, haven't done Java, I would be happy if somebody contributed those, but um, yeah, has, nothing, hasn't happened there. Um, but yeah, these issues all seem, actually let's, let's see if I can make this happen. Um, so I want to be able to detect if a ref that's being used in pre-commit is um, mutable or not. No brain fuck, yeah, I haven't implemented brain fuck either. Hey Metabytes, thank you for the follow. Every follow counts. Uh, so let's see if I can identify this one. So the background behind this is pre-commit 
gets caches, all of the hooks. Well, so it, it installs hooks based on Git repositories, and it clones and caches them based on a uh, kind of a two pair, um, or like a two item pair. Uh, so I can show you how that kind of looks. Cache prefix db.db. Uh, it stores that data in a SQLite database, and it's basically the key being the repository and the version it clones at, and then the value is the um, output directory that it gets installed at. You can see, like, when I installed Black at some point at this version, it wrote that uh, environment to this location here. And if we look at that, uh, did not copy properly. Uh, if I look in this directory here, um, it's a clone of ambv slash black, and it should match. This this SHA should be the same as the tag 18.9 beta 0. And you can see the tag is stable or 18.9 beta 0. And so that's how pre-commit manages its, its clones. Um, but what I want to happen is I want it to issue a warning if um, if a non-permanent reference is used, because uh, say somebody cloned a master, uh, pre-commit would never upgrade this repo here. It would just always match master to master. Um, so it would it would always keep that being the, the same. And so uh, using mutable references is not really supported. And the docs go into this in a little bit of detail down here. Um, yeah, pregament aims configuration aims to give a repeatable and fast experience and therefore intentionally doesn't provide facilities for unpinned the latest version for hook repositories. Uh, blah blah blah. Pre-commit assumes that the value of rev is an immutable reference, such as a tag or a SHA, and will cache based on that. Using a branch name or head for the value of rev is not supported and will only represent the state at the time of installation and will not automate automatically update. So I basically want to take this sentence and turn it into a warning. Um, but I am not quite sure where to put that without slowing everything down. Like I could put it at clone time, but then you wouldn't get the warning all the time. So maybe that's the best place to put it. I guess we would put it here. Let's see what we can do with that. Put master in here, and we can just delete all this. For and what? Pre-commit home does is it's a it's kind of a like undocumented way to put the pre-commit hash or cache in a different place. So this little set up that environment. Maybe I should have picked something smaller. Wait, why did it finish? Oh. Yeah, and so you can see like this is the structure that it's set up in this SQLite database here. We'll have that. Um... We'll have that pregament hook slash master. So this should put us at our breakpoint. So 
we have directory. Dash C directory. Uh, check type of ref. Show ref. Everything is pointing me at get show ref. <laughs> Determine if we checked out a branch or tag with get. That sounds like what we want. Get symbolic ref head. Symbolic ref head. Ref's heads master. What does that look like if it's a tag? Let's try these three cases. Repository. No. That's the one that we already saw. Reps heads master. That is not a symbolic ref. Uh, it will fail if you're on a tag. Okay. Not helpful. That's helpful. Get branch crep. <laughs> oh, these are all garbage. Tags can describe this try dash dash tags. Okay, so that's how we can tell whether it's exactly a tag. I guess we could know whether it's a SHA if it's entirely hexadecimal. I guess that still doesn't fix the problem though, because if somebody had a tag that was mutable, we wouldn't know. Like the common one is, the common problem and like the reason that I kind of wanted to do this is because black suggests the wrong thing in the readme. Which I've been needing to update. Like uh... Like this is just wrong, but I haven't fixed it yet. I don't know. I think I'm tired. I think I'm gonna call the stream here. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I'll do my spiel and then um, send you guys off to someone else. Um, but thank you all for stopping by. Uh, if you want to catch any of, or if you missed any part of the stream and you want to catch that, I put them up on YouTube after the fact. They usually go up at least by the next day. Uh, my YouTube is youtube.com slash Anthony Writes Code. Uh, and I, I upload previous streams there. There's other educational content there, but 
Uh, I haven't uploaded videos in a long time because it takes quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of work to put a video together. Uh, but if you want to check out some previous streams, this one was a particularly good one. This uh, Vexoig memory leak. Um, this was a pretty good stream too, uh, although it's a lot of like talking and not so much code. I explained a lot of really cool stuff there though. Um, yeah, that's that. Uh, if you want to get notified of streams, I stream uh, usually on Saturdays at 1 p.m. Um, and usually on Saturdays at 1 p.m. and sometimes during the week at 6 p.m. and those are Pacific time. Um, but other than that, I don't stream all that often, so it's usually like once or twice a week. And next weekend, I'll be at PyCon, so probably won't be able to stream next weekend. Um, but hopefully I'll have some cool PyCon stuff to share the week after. Um, if you want to get notified of um, streams, either follow the channel or follow me on Twitter. I usually announce them like... 60 minutes or 70 minutes beforehand. Um, that's kind of my way of letting people know when the stream's gonna happen. But that's all I've got for today. Uh, U37J, yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to check it out next time. You made a new one with uh, different. Oh, Rot 47. Oh, that was probably it. Anyway, uh, but yeah, I'll have to check that out next time. Uh, finish your decrypting puzzle. But thank you all for stopping by, and uh, have a good one. I'll go find someone to raid. <laughs>